Throughout history, free thinkers have outraged the religious with their wacky ideas about the virtues of free speech, reason, and of course, eating babies. Now, God is dying, and it's time to dispose of his remains. From the pits of hell, Satan sends two puppets of the imperialist West and the Zionist Jews against God, Islam, and tiny kittens to bring you their propaganda and conspire for a new world order. This is Secular Jihadist for a Muslim Enlightenment with Ali Rizwi and Armin Navabi. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Secular Jihadists for a Muslim Enlightenment. My name is Ali Rizvi, and with us, uh, well, with me, we have a um, uh, very frazzled uh, Armin Navabi, because this huh? podcast almost didn't happen thanks to a Skype glitch. Armin, are you okay? I'll, I'll recover. You'll recover? Okay, just take a deep breath. A deep breath. Take, take a deep breath. <laughs> I need this Sam Harris's not- new app, but he's, it's not on Android yet. The, we okay, we yeah. Android people are constantly discriminated against. Yeah, you need to get a Mac. Anyway, so um, okay, so like, so I'm, I'm, I, I'm like super excited about today's episode because I've been trying to get this guy on for a very long time. So I'm going to embarrass you a little bit. I'm talking to my guest. Um, you're kind of a hero of mine. I think that some of the stuff that you've been doing uh, recently uh, has been incredibly inspiring and the way that you're going about your dialogue is amazing. We've got with us, okay, I should probably introduce you. We've got with us Abdullah Samir. Abdullah Samir is an increasingly popular and influential atheist writer and YouTuber who was once a very religious Muslim. He preached Islam for about 15 years and even founded really popular Islamic websites like Light Upon Light and Verse by Verse Quran. Uh, in 2016, Abdullah, you made a video uh, announcing that you had left Islam. And uh, the video was fairly controversial and got, uh, now it's nearing a million views on YouTube. And, you know, he's got tens of thousands of YouTube subscribers in, in just a very short time. And uh, we're going to actually touch on a lot of stuff in this podcast. At least I want to. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, again, Abdullah, I think that you're, I told the other Abdullah, the Lagandal, when he was here, that uh, you guys really are, I think, the, the, the future, the the way that this whole movement's going, and the other thing is, like when we interviewed the other Abdullah, he was also banned from Facebook, and right now I'm hearing you're banned from Facebook, right? Wait, you're banned from Facebook? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Oh. Shit. How did you get banned? You're so like the way that you write is so thoughtful, and but what yes. Happened? So so thank you so much, guys, for having me on and uh, for your you know um, over the top kind words. Uh, really, really honored to hear that. And appreciate it. You know what? What I'm doing, obviously, it it comes from the bottom of my heart. Right? It's it's a very sincere and thoughtful kind of. You know, what I'm doing is just it's just it's very sincere, and I think that comes out. It comes comes across when people when when you talk to people. So I I do appreciate the kind words. Um, and uh, yeah, what happened was honestly, I don't think anyone reported my post, but I, I had a post called Abdullah Samir's bigot test. And I had like a few examples of like how to spot a bigot. So, so based on my kind of experiences, you know, discussing with Muslims, ex-Muslims, atheists of all sorts, even Christians and other people that, that kind of um, I've been discussing with, there's, there's a few common kind of criteria, which um, someone that, that's, you know, trying to throw like all Muslims under the bus tends to have. And some of the things they say, Um, and so what happened was, you know, one of the things I said was, you know, Muslims are rapists, right? And that was on the list. So, well, you know, most, you know, ISIS is true Islam. This is going to get demonetized (laughs) and this video is going to get great. Now this this YouTube video is going to get reported. Okay, go on. So what happened was, um, I got flagged because even though I wasn't saying that, like a bot could have interpreted it as I was saying Muslims are bad people. Right. Whereas what I was trying to say was these are some things that people say which are over the top. And if someone is saying this, you know, I question their motives. Basically something like that, right? And it was Oh, so yeah, it's it's like should, that guy. We should from, go we should go report like history <laughs> channels re- like coverage of like Nazi Germany and be like this is Nazi propaganda because obviously they have like Hitler speech and stuff right there. So basically, based on the standards that we have now, all of those could be uh, considered racist or 
I don't know. Like, yeah. I don't, people don't like, I don't think that social media has not been able to yet figure out how to look at the context where we we're discussing these things. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think, like I said, I think it was just a bot that flagged me, but I did ask for a manual review and uh, somehow I even failed that. So even the person reviewing is probably someone working in Philippines, according to one little snippet of a documentary that that's coming out about Facebook and the people that screen the posts. And I don't think they even understood what I was writing about because they, they, they said, no, this is actually hate speech. So I, I guess, I, you know, there's a documentary guess, you know, coming out. What yeah. About, list? about the screeners. Uh, I forget what they're called. The sweepers hey, or that's something racist like that. Tours Filipino people. Do you think <laughs> Filipino people? They, they were the ones kind of featured in the, in the film. So right. there could be other people working there too, but that's what they were kind of showing. Right. Wow. So anyway, oh, we, we hope you're back soon and we're going to try to do whatever we but can. Did to get you mention that this, uh, did you mention the, how influential, Abdullah was like as a Muslim. I, I was li- reading the live chat. Did you mention? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did, okay, I did. I did. We did the whole introduction. Okay. But um, I don't so I. <laughs> yeah, but uh, so I want to start Abdullah with. So you you've got a really interesting background. Yeah. And um, uh, so so you were uh, you were born into a family. You were born in Kenya, I think. Mm-hmm. Kenya. Well, do you have your birth certificate? <laughs> oh no, no, I'm kidding. So you were born in Kenya. Your father was uh, is Ismaili, a Muslim. Uh, which is a subsect of uh, so Shia not really Islam. Muslim. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, not really. <laughs> but your, your your mother is uh, Sunni, and it yes. seems like uh, you uh, you once uh, you know you started getting into some of the Sunni practices when you were younger, and then you eventually veered from Ismailism towards Sunni Islam, and then you became a very religious Sunni Muslim, and then you gave that up, uh, and and you became an atheist. So. Can you lead us through that transition? How did you start from Ismaili is like a very sort of uh, open and yes. uh, relevant. They're pro secular. They're pro, you know. Yeah. So how how did that uh, how did that happen? So my family is very. I mean, I'm thankful for this now that my family is very liberal. My mom and dad are really accepting and understanding. And so what happened was I grew up like you said in this very liberal kind of uh, religion that was very easygoing. Doesn't put a lot of strain on you in your life doesn't put a lot of demands on your, um, you know, your schedule. For example, there's, you pray early in the morning before, you know, anyone wakes up the dawn prayer. And then there's one after, you know, like seven o'clock or something. And it's fixed times, unlike the, the Islamic namaz, which is based on the sunrise and sunset. So everything's very convenient, very easygoing, um, and very liberal. There's, you know, you, you can eat, you should eat halal if you can, but like, again, there's not a lot of emphasis on stuff like that. There's no hijab. Um, you, like I said, you don't pray five so times a day. Even Ramadan, uh, I think Ramadan is like, you just kind of uh, ch- uh, choose, you don't necessarily, I, I had, cause I went to the Aghan university, which is, you know, the Aghan is the imam of the, of the Ismailis. And I, uh, I had many Ismaili friends and some of them, when they used to fast, they used to just say that, okay, I have a vice. I get angry. I'm just going to try to control my anger. That was their fast. So yeah, was, uh, I, I I think there's many different like you will find in among Ismailis some will like go all the way they'll pray they'll fast no premarital intimacy like for example my parents' generation that was really frowned upon like living together before marriage but but also but but from the religion itself there's not a lot of emphasis on these things like nobody says you must fast in Ramadan like I've never heard that as an Ismaili and so I was completely Ismaili I was not like at all Sunni whatsoever until about the age of eighteen. Um, because, you know, I went by my dad's religion, not my mom's. My mom was still Sunni, uh, but not really Ismaili religious. Ismaili is a subset of Shiism, right? So that- Yeah, but even some Shias would don't like to say that because they consider Sh- Ismailis to be so like Morality. out there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but they, yeah, but they, they, they consider they, themselves they, they are, Shia, like, Ismaili Muslim. Right now, 12 mm-hmm. Shias are the majority yes. Shias, but the Ismailis were the original Shias that were in power in Egypt before the 12 Shias became popular. Yeah, the Fatimid. Yeah, if you go back in history, the Fatimid Empire, um, I believe, was an Ismaili empire. So right. so from, from there, what happened was in my high school, in a public high school in Canada, I uh, had some Sunni Muslim friends that were having a prayer and stuff. And so I decided to join them and, you know, like I had a little bit of exposure from, you know, doing the Eid namaz or the Eid prayer, the Eid salah. And I prayed sometimes with my Sunni family members, even though that wasn't the thing I normally did. And so I was comfortable and I just joined them and I asked my dad, my dad was very easygoing. He's like, yeah, you know, however you want to worship God, you know, if you want to pray with them, that's fine. So then as I started to be, you know, to do the Sunni way of uh, the Sunni thing, I, I felt more comfortable with it. I felt like this is this is more in line with the 
religious doctrine, the Quran itself. And, and I felt more and more that Ismailism was, it was too far removed from the Quran. That's what I felt. And, and to be frank, like the main, the main thing about praying to Aga Khan, or what do they call Mola Bapa, to me, it seemed like Shirk. that goes completely, yeah, exactly. I mean, it goes completely against the, the thesis of the Quran, yeah. which is to pray directly to Allah. So from is my against Tawheed is the most fundamental part of Islam, right? So, yeah, I mean, yeah. and and with, with respect for Ismailis, they they don't look at it in that literal way. They they look at it a different way. They say that, anyways. I'm not going to justify from their perspective, but they have their perspective to it. Like you know, whatever it is, how, however so, they justify. So I wanted to ask you just one thing really quick before we go on is with Ismailism. I know that uh, Ismailis are so just to let you know my my wife is actually from the Ismaili sect as well, and I mean she's an atheist, but uh, there is a. Uh, there is an element of secrecy about their beliefs. Like they're quiet about it because, if, for example, in Pakistan, they could be subject to a lot of attacks when people find out how far removed they are, and they would fight. They would consider them apostates and heretics. So, how open are you now when people ask you about Ismailism? Do you speak about their beliefs in public, or are you concerned yeah, about their absolutely. security? No, 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 no. The Ismail, I think that's a historical kind of thing that still exists in the Ismaili religion. Because they were historically oppressed, there's some rules in the religion that only, for example, Ismailis can go into the um, the Jamaat Khana, right? The the mosque. But like, for example, like like, uh, and and you know, technically, you're not supposed to like you know share the farman, the sayings of Mola Baba or Aga Khan with non-Ismailis. But like, no, like I have no issue talking about Ismailism. The only thing is that, like, you guys are the original assassins. <laughs> yeah, the the assassins were smiley as well. Right. Okay, uh, you you can't drop that without explaining it. So I'll go ahead and explain that. <laughs> yeah, there was a Even the word set Hussein, of yeah. extreme smileys who went and they smashed the black rock of the Kaaba of uh, the holiest temple in Islam. So I I don't know too much about the history there, but but they were, but, they were, but the word assassin comes from your from Ismaili sect. Like you guys went and like they had you guys you guys. <laughs> you guys yeah you guys you guys had the yeah. first suicide missions right because they made <laughs> no, plans no, no, no. to yeah no it's true the suicide before there were bombs there were suicide missions and the Ismailis were the first suicide um, you know people that basically the the way it was a suicide is that they had a plan to go out uh, assassinate and an, uh, like a Sunni. Uh, important figure, right? Like a caliph or somebody else, like some scholars from the, in Baghdad or whatever. Uh, but the, they made all the plans on how to get there and kill the person, but they just didn't make a plan on how to get out once they, uh, once the assassination was done. So it was technically a suicide mission. And that's how originally we, we had uh, suicide missions in Islam. So it started with you guys. <laughs> so when, just to clarify one thing so nobody gets the wrong idea i am in no way a smiley no, I, uh, I do not believe aga khan is a nur of allah or anything like that um, I, 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 I don't i don't believe in ismailism any more than i believe in sunni islam um right. one of the most quickest slanders or the most common slanders i get against me is this guy was never a true muslim he was ismaili but the reality is i mean i didn't talk about it much but I was Sunni too and too. When I converted to Sunnism um, from Ismailism at around the age of 18 or so, I completely left Ismailism behind. And I, I became 100% Sunni. Like I, I created a website, lightuponlight.com to promote you know, um, my views and the, Isma the Sunni religion, the is Islamic religion, you know, through Sunnism. Right. And uh, I really much believed in it. Not, not so, so I left this Ismailism. Is light up yeah, this is Light Upon Light, right? I think. Yes, lightuponlight.com. No. The website's still up there. I, I kept it. I just kept it as a, yeah. as a kind of back backup to prove that I'm say, I am where I say I am. But people in real life who know me, they know who I am. Like, no, no but I actually love the website because when you go on it, and what's the URL? Lightuponlight.com? Or, yes, yes. Yeah, when you go on it, you see first you see these pictures of all these like Islamic videos, and then suddenly this pop up comes up that says, I no longer run this. No, this website is no longer active. I've left Islam. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. If you go right to Islamic websites, like, oh, by the way, guys, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no longer functional. But uh, yeah, so I, yeah, it, it definitely is still up. Um, right. So I have a, a, did you move to, uh, you know, because Ismailis are, as Armin said, you know, they're part of the Shia subsect. So yes. 
you know, you said that Ismailism you thought was too removed from the Quran. Did mm-hmm. you explore ethnoshery Shiaism? Um, because that is no. a little bit closer than yeah, true. Um, the twelve is that just the tw- Jaffari, twelver, yeah, the twelver. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I think it was yeah. just happenstance for me. It's just my friends were Sunni, and so I was mainly you know exposed to that point of view. And um, sometimes people ask me like you know, why did you, you know, go, why did you deep dive into Islam? Like, wh- how is it that now that you're leaving it? But at that time you were like, yeah, like Islam all the way, baby. Um, <laughs> it's because, it's because at that time I was a much less critical person than I am now. And I was willing to kind of accept it wholeheartedly. Like I kind of already had the religious doc- indoctrination. Um, I believed in God. I believed in Muhammad as a messenger. And, and I'm like, Hey, the Quran's the final word of God. So the only issue I found was Ismailis are not following the Quran properly according to what I thought. So then I just wanted to adjust that. But I was already in the wall, like religious thing. Right. So, it, it, you know, at that time I didn't, I wasn't critical, but so, you know, so, now. So do you think, do you think, so what do you say to people that say, well, at least Ismailis are better than Sunni Muslims. Isn't that like something we should promote given that they're so moderate or liberal or so easygoing? Uh, why not? Like, if we want to have Islam, why not? Sh- why not have Ismaili Islam <clears throat> instead of Sunni Islam? Let's just well, that. I, you know, one thing I actually thought about was like, why don't I just be like an agnostic Ismaili? Like, why do I want to be atheist? Like, why don't I keep that community? Because that community is there. There's a you know huge community backing. Right. And and then I'm like, when I thought about it, I'm like, I just can't accept that I have to like this guy, you know, the leader of Ismailism. The Ismailis pay him twelve point five percent of the gross wealth. Shit. One eight, and this is like you have to do this, right? Otherwise, like something bad will happen to you, or you know, it's not good, right? It's not right. good, like it's not good for your karma, whatever, right? Anyway, so you have to do that. Yeah, I mean, he's he's very rich. I mean, he's got he yeah. breeds race horses. He lives in France. He's got, I mean, his his university, the one that I went to, is one of the nicest campuses I've seen so in the they, world. They actually think that if you don't pay this one eighth, uh, you got something bad is going to happen to you. Well, I mean, I don't know exactly what the the religion teaches, but I do know my dad actually told me that. Things go well in life, you know, as long as you're paying this. And if you stop paying it, something bad can happen. I don't know. Like, maybe that's just like a superstitious thing. Mm. But it's definitely enforced. Like, you need to do this, right? I mean, of course, no one's checking that you're actually paying it. But there's people that even pay 25%. Now, money is not the only thing, right? It's, it's, it's more like you're accepting his leadership right. as a spiritual, like, leader of, you know... I, I don't know. I just can't weird, do it. Like, like if you look at, he looks like a businessman. He's wearing suits, right? <laughs> like he looks like a like a huge million, like billionaire with like that's running business and charities. Like he doesn't look like a religious leader, does he? Well, his he grandmother is, was Rita Hayworth, right? Rita, Rita Hayworth, like a Hollywood. Uh, his son is married to Kendra Spears. His daughter is uh, there's you know she she smokes and you know she's been seen with a, a glass of shit. I mean they're actually very. The family of, of him, and he is a documented descendant of Muhammad, right? But he is, uh, he's sort of, this is my understanding. My understanding as, as, as I got it, and by the way, I've been to Jamal Khan many times. You know what you were saying about the community. The community is very strong and they're very supportive. And it's weird. My wife and I are both atheists, but whenever we go there, there there's always this food and there's, you know, that whenever they have the celebrations, they dance. They, so it's, it's actually quite a lot of fun. And so you're right about the community aspect, but, um, uh, w- one thing that they, yeah, th- what they, what they said was that he's. Uh, uh, I've lost my train of thought. Okay, I have that. something to say. Uh, yeah, which, go ahead. Uh, so it, it's actually what this what you what you said was actually what I wanted to get at because it's not just that your point you know is not that it's less harmful. The, at the end of the day, it's nonsense. Like this is why I love excess smileys. Right, I think we uh, you know we have some in the live chat today as well. Is because excess smileys prove that your your nonsense doesn't have to be the worst nonsense out there for it to be nonsense, right? People still look at their religion, and maybe it's not as harmful as fucking Wahhabi Islam or something like that, but it's still bullshit. And they're like, okay, this doesn't make any sense. I can't accept this. I'm going to leave it, right? So excess Smileys and ex other versions of his ex Sufis and stuff like that shows like it's a really good indication that as when something doesn't make sense, you know, you you there are people that are still willing to leave it. And and when you what you mentioned that the money that people pay 
it, it's still harm. This is this is people money that people work hard and they're giving it to this fucking billionaire that doesn't need it. This mm. is still harm, even though it's not maybe suicide bombers or like terrorist attacks or stuff like that. It's still harm and it's worth tackling this. Um, yeah. Yeah, go on. Sorry. Yeah, I would say like, um, you're right. It is harm. I mean, it's not to say that, you know, one thing that Ismail will always tell you is Aga Khan does a lot of charitable work and it's true. Like, you know, there's like hospitals and schools that he builds and Aga Khan Development um, Network has tons of charity all over the world, which doesn't justify, you know, them saying that he has a religious authority to take one eighth of everyone's wealth. Right. Of course, that doesn't justify. I'm not justifying. But what I'm saying is I do... I do think there's different levels of harm, right? And I do think that a suicide bomber, that a jihadist and ISIS extremist is obviously a far, far, far worse for the world and even Wahhabism than like Ismailism. Ismailism is far less harmful to, to the world. Right. And even my own family members have, have said this, like, you know, one, I had one family member who I won't mention saying, I wish, like I have, I have a younger brother who is still Sunni Muslim and you know, I don't want to say what it is, but someone said, I wish you didn't make him or you didn't guide him or miss, you know, make him convert to Sunni. Because as an Ismaili, he'd be far better off than he is as a Sunni. Because I, the sacrifice is that much more. Like but, this. But, but the point yeah, is yeah. that but, but the point is uh -huh. that your the harm that you're addressing doesn't have to be the worst harm in the world for it to be worth addressing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, yeah, I think that's what Abdullah is saying. So he's saying that he, does, he doesn't believe in the divinity. He doesn't. And that's why he kind of left it because uh, he couldn't accept that he had to accept this guy as as the the divine leader. Right. But at the same time, so the, these things are complicated. And this is kind of true because, again, I, I went to this the university I went to. Uh, the Ahan actually does do a lot of, he promotes secularism. He promotes separation of religion and state. He promotes the idea that people should keep the religion to themselves, forget about the political thing. And this is the interesting thing, Armin. So the Ismaili, the Ismaili sect is probably the only one that has somehow found in its theology to put the Quran secondary. Because that's what they have... Good, that's not a good thing, though. This, the no, 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 no. I, listen, yeah. it's not a... It's not, it's, of course, it's, we've already agreed that at okay. the top level, it's not a good thing. I just thing want to talk for to anybody the new to say. people that are listening to our podcast that Ismaili, at the end of the day, is give, making Islam look good, and Islam does not deserve to look good. But go okay, on. Okay, so sure, that that's fine. But what I'm saying is, uh, over guess. here is it the, it's an interesting way to because in most of the other sects, you don't have this. And Abdullah, correct me if I'm wrong. But what they have is that you have a divine appointee of. God on earth. And I'll give you the devil's advocate point of view in a bit too. But you have the divine appointee of Allah on earth and he is right here. So if you want to ask about whether you should uh, drink alcohol sometimes or occasionally, you know, you don't have to wear hijab, you can uh, have a Western lifestyle, he'll come out and he can tell you that. And his word is the divine word. So that makes a Quran sort of like a historical relic that is sort of respected, but it's not a primary yeah. source of, of how you, you live your life. You could do all that without the Islam label. That's my uh, problem. Uh, uh, I mean, that's, that's right. But I'm just, we're I'm drawing just, a comparison. I know, I know. Between. I'm just telling our news <laughs> listeners. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, no, that's, that's fine. Yeah. But, yeah. but the, the, the devil's advocate point of view, right, is uh, that uh, this could go right. The, the fact that the this Aga Khan just happens to be very, very progressive is an is, is in a way an accident because there is another sect of Ismailis called the Boras. They didn't happen to get a guy who was as good as this. So they practice FGM. They totally cover up their women. They're incredibly conservative and more like sort of traditional Sunni Islam. So um, uh, this it, it kind of got lucky, but but this is probably the most progressive sect uh, of Islam that's out there. Thanks to the luck that this guy happens to be a little bit more progressive and pro-secular. Yeah. Doesn't mean he's right, as Armin said. It but, didn't, like, yeah. it's not even just this guy, but it's, it was from the very original split when you had the Bora and Ismaili split. And one of the brothers went one direction, which is like what you said, like more kind of like liberal. And the other brother went one the direction. conservative. Hmm? No, I was thinking of the band. Never mind, I forgot it. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, Ali's a dad, so he makes that. Yeah, jokes. yeah, yeah. That's why I make that jokes. Right, I, I make. That. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no. So, so yeah, you're you're right in what you're saying. Uh, what you said about him being the kind of divine appointee. Um, you know, I actually had a question to ask my dad. Where, you know, they believe that you know, kind of like what you know how the twelve imams have knowledge of everything. This is kind of a sheer belief. 
And so Ismailis take that to even the living imam. They call him the living imam and they believe that he has knowledge of everything. So I actually asked my dad, like when I was becoming Sunni, I said, why do you pray to him if he doesn't, like how you really believe he knows everything? And my dad was like, yeah. So I'm like, okay, wh- if we call him up on the phone right now, is he going to know that my name? Like, <laughs> like I was being like logical, right? Mm-hmm. So I had a little bit of logic that I was trying to use back then. Um... But but um, I didn't. You have to ask, I didn't take it all the way. Does he know about the mole that is growing on my ass or something? <laughs> like does he know? Yeah, no, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but go on. Yeah, no. So I was like kind of trying to be a little bit logical about it back then, but I just didn't see my way all the way to like out of Islam. But even back then, I was thinking like, what's the point? Even I was asking my dad like, what's the point of praying to Allah and also praying to Aga Khan? Like, I didn't see the point of having kind of like two different people to pray to because Ismailis, they ask him for help. They ask him for like blessings too, right? And then, you know, my dad said, you know, if you look at the sun, the sun is too bright. So you need like sunglasses. So Aga Khan, he's like the sunglasses to filter out the bright light. Or something. I don't know, he came up with something. Yeah, right, but yeah. isn't it like, it's kind of like the Trinity though, in a way, because you have, you know, you have God no, who's a divine. It's like no, no, saints, it is actually. No, I'm it's a... like the saints in the Catholic, it's Catholic doctrine. And Sonys are like the Protestants that are saying like, what the fuck? No, 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 no. No, what I'm saying is like the, the Trinity in, in Ismailism, you, you have uh, you have Allah and then you have Ali and you have the Imams and all of them are the, the same kind of uh, spirit. They're all the spirit of yeah. God, but they're mm-hmm. divided among different elements like the Trinity. So in the same way that how you're saying you're praying the Aga Khan and you're praying to God, it's kind of, you know, you, you talk yeah. to Jesus, you pray to Jesus, but you yeah. also pray to, to God, right? Is it but, something like that? Or Yeah, Jesus is a good analogy, I feel, because again, it's like, it's the, he's somehow connected to Allah and something like that. Yeah, right. there's some can we, connection. Can we, guys, we <laughs> named this topic of this discussion how to talk to Muslims, right? So we need yeah, to. Yeah, no, no, we're this getting ended to that. Up, this ended is up, so interesting. Yeah, but it ended up being yeah. about Ismail, uh, Ismaili Islam. So can we? Uh, so your experience yeah. uh, as a Sunni does that does that help talk to Muslim because you were like a, because like you being. Would you say um, Islamic preacher? Would you say that it, ha, that's what you were? Were you an Islamic preacher? Is that a good? Yeah. Wait, you got frozen. Abdullah. Yeah. Oh no, no, go on, Abdullah. Did we lose Abdullah? I think we might have lost him. Oh no! Fucking Skype. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, hold on. Let's, let's get this timestamp. Guys, hold on. We're gonna try to get Abdullah back. All right. Let me see, Abdullah. This is the second Abdullah we have had. By the way, Abdullah yeah. means. Um, should we get? Uh, should I call him again, or how do yeah, I? Yeah, call him again. Call him again. Okay, but would I have to kick out the original ones? No, just okay, add no, him no, to he's the call. Gone. Add him to the call. There we go. Yeah, we've been having like lots of Skype issues today for some reason. Hey, hey, hey you're back. Hey. Okay, good. Okay, we're okay. back on track. Yeah, so. Oh. Now I'm back. okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, my Skype crashed. Skype is not behaving well. Oh no, it's not. Yeah, we know that today. There's something up with Skype. So, but yeah, Armin, can you repeat your question? I forgot my question. Oh, like so, would you say you're an Islamic preacher? Would you say that? Yeah. yeah. No. 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 I would. I was not an Islamic preacher by any means. I was someone that was a motivated, um, sincere Muslim. Let's put it like that. Someone that truly believed that Islam was the truth. Um, I was an informal preacher in the sense that I did, you know, Friday khutbas at universities and even at the musalla, like a small mosque downtown. Um, I did stuff like that, but I wasn't, I wouldn't call myself a preacher because that wasn't my job. I was a family man, you know, I had my family and on the side, however I could, I wanted to promote Islam. I used to like be involved in like dawah booths. So I used to have a booth at, at I used to go to like on the da'wah, weekend. Explain that. What is that? Dawah is to call people to Islam, to preach Islam, basically. So I was involved in that process, giving out any, pamphlets. Did you ever convert anyone to Islam? I, I, I made a lot of Muslims religious. So I can give you tons of stories of Muslims that were not religious. Mm. And because of me, like including my brother, my younger brother and a lot of my family members, um, right. my wife as well became more religious because of me. Um, at the time. But did so, you make any non-Muslim a Muslim? No, I, I don't think so. Uh, so unless more through my effect, website. Have you made, so as an ex-Muslim now, have you made any Muslim a non-Muslim? You can say very much so. So right. I've, I've started keeping track because I kept getting, I got a lot of people telling yeah, me. Yeah, I saw that. 
Yeah. So I made a I made a list now of testimonies on my blog, and it's over. I think it's I don't know around thirty now. So I I still have to update the list because a few people told me I can add them, and I haven't added them yet. And these are just people that are directly have directly contacted me, and said you specifically helped me to leave Islam. Nice. Um, but like, it's actually more than that because people, a lot of people don't contact me. Right? A lot of people don't, don't even know I'm that I can be contacted, right? They just see my video or maybe they heard about me or they, someone sent them my WhatsApp or one of my videos or something. Um, but yeah, so far there's, there's only 30 people. So I'm, I'm more, I'm more successful as an atheist <laughs> than yes. as a Muslim. Yeah. I don't know. I, and, and, and in less Wait, time, I actually saw that blog post. On your side. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I have saw logic that on my side. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> But I, yeah, I saw that you have all these testimonials, of people just writing to you and saying, oh, "Okay, yeah, no, thanks to you, now I'm next Muslim, or I've left Islam because of you." So it's uh, it's actually really. We're gonna link to that. I have that uh, link to that blog, so we're gonna link to it in this uh, in the description. I made a note here. So here's so, a question: so tell- Is it is it easier to make a non-religious Muslim to a religious one than make two questions? First question: Is it easier to make a non-religious Muslim to a religious one? Than to make a religious Muslim into a non-religious one, question number one. Question number two: Is it easier to make a, reli- to a Muslim religious Muslim to a non-religious one compared to making a religious Muslim to an ex-Muslim atheist? Okay, I'm getting confused with all the Muslim. Yeah, yeah, I'm really confused. Let's do too. the first question first. Okay, first question. Um, I don't know if it's easier or harder. It depends on each person, right? Like some people are successful with different things. I, I believe that you know it was my. Again, it was my sincerity, I think, that, that, you know, it's anyone's sincerity, anyone that has any sort of, if you really believe in something, that has an effect on people around you. When people see that you're making sacrifices and you're, you know, doing your very, very best to pray five times a day or whatever it is, that has an effect on people around you, right? Because they see and they want to know, why is he like that? Um, and I think because of that sincerity is how it's, it's the reason why I was able to leave Islam. Because as I was talking to people, eventually I got to a point where I was talking to someone who was like, kind of giving me some points back to think about. And I'm like, Hey, that's a good who, point. Let me look into that. Who's that? Because who's I was, that? can you give, can you give a shout out to the person? Sure. So, so the first time this happened, um, other than little tiny holes and little tiny doubts that happened here and there, um, the first big thing that happened was some guy online that, that was kind of like, discussing on Facebook and, you know, people say Facebook debates don't work, but this guy was like, he was like, I almost converted to Islam. He was a Christian, Unitarian Christian or something. Mm. And then he's like, I, I did some research into it and I found out a lot of the stories in the Quran are actually ancient Jewish myths. I'm like, yeah, I know. They're like from the Torah and they're also revealed by God. He's like, no, 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 no. He, he said, these stories are coming from the rabbis. And the, like the, from the Talmud, which is not considered like a, a revelation, right? Basically, the like stories they would tell. Oh, and somehow okay, right? okay. Yes. And like, so yeah. then at that point, I started looking into it. And I'm like, whoa, what's up with that? And I'm like, no, I'm going to disprove this guy. I'm going to show him because I believe I was on the truth, right? Right. And then as I looked into it, I started being, I started, it was getting murkier and murkier. And I'm like, a lot of these stories do seem to be made up, right? And they do seem to have found their way into the Quran. And on top of it, the ones that found their way into the Quran were also in a language similar to the Quran in Syriac and in a time that was similar to the Quran. So it started off with the Jewish stories mm. and then like Cain and Abel and stuff. And then it became a bigger question of like, for example, Alexander the Great or Dolkanin. And, you know, the story oh, is... The guy of, with the horns, right? <laughs> yeah, Dolkanin, the, the two-horned guy, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, then, and then it became like the infancy gospel. And how did that end up in the Quran? And how come that, that was also in, in, in Syriac, right? right? And so more and more, I started to have trouble. I'm like... I don't know how to make sense out of this. But then I said, okay, you know what? I, I talked to some of my friends and said, you know, just forget it. Don't, don't let these doubts, you know, misguide you. And so I shut it off for, for one more full year. I became a Muslim. And then one year later, the doubts came back because I was in Ramadan in the mosque and the Imam was like, these scientists, they think they're so smart. And Allah says in the Quran, he holds up the sky without any pillars. And the Sheikh's name was Dawood Butt. And he basically made it some, he was making fun of science. And he was like, and then all these doubts came back to my mind. I'm like, whoa, this doesn't even sound like God is speaking. It sounds like some man wrote this, right? Right. 
And this, ha- this was when I finally ended up leaving Islam because at this point, I'm like, I can't deal with this doubts anymore, which, which I was blocking. When was this? Was this in 2016 or around the time you made the video? 2015. 2015, yeah. Yeah, July 2015. So it's three years ago. And at this point, I'm like, I have to find out. I have to know because I, I was having these doubts, like serious doubts now. And I'm like, I have to look into it. So I read everything I could find. Right. And, and then I'm like, okay, I'm not Muslim anymore. And that's when I started to come out on Facebook. And then eventually I made the blog. And then I think Did like you get a any year- backlash. Of course. <clears throat> so originally what happened was I had first people were like, are you like doing like a social experiment or something? Like <laughs> how can you posting all these things about like, you know, Islam, like negative things, right? And or like, you know, questions or, you know, Sorry. issues. And then people said, tell me, brother, this is not how you get help. You need to talk to an imam. Don't be posting your doubts online and spreading fitna in the community. Fitna. You're causing trouble for people, right? So you had a lot of your original Islamic followers who were still on your Facebook and everything. My Muslim and- friends, not my Islamic. I wouldn't call them Islamic yeah. followers. I would call them my Muslim friends. And right. so my Muslim friends. That's what you get- called your Islamic followers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. No, on. these are my yeah, friends. Yeah, because at that time like- you didn't. You weren't a big YouTube. No, no, I wasn't. No, you were. Just- you were. Okay, okay. No, yeah, I mean, I had my, I had my... I had my Islamic website, but I didn't tell people I ran an Islamic website. Like nobody right. knew my name right. wasn't on it. I didn't want any credit for it. I just did it right for like the oh, sake you of were a humble Muslim, just doing it for <laughs> the sake of Allah. Right, Go ahead. I didn't want to lose any good deeds, so I didn't want to tell anyone it was my website. Right. Okay. Anyways, so yeah, when I, up. Right, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so so when people started to see that, they were concerned about me. Some people actually, one one guy, he's like, "Listen, I almost became atheist." And I, and then I, I saw, I solved the problems and I, I became Muslim again. So at that point, I deleted all my Facebook posts. I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm going to solve my problems too. I don't want to misguide anybody else or whatever. I said, I'm going to meet this guy and I'm going to talk about it. And I'm going to find out how did he come back to Islam? Right. So I went and I met this guy and I'm like, let's talk about this. And I, and I had a list of all my questions, but at this point I was still like poking holes in the Quran. I hadn't looked at the bigger picture which was why I believe in Islam in the first place. Like I hadn't shifted the burden of oh, proof God. back mm. to where it is. Yeah. I was more like, I have these problems with the Quran, right? And which is kind of like how it starts, right? right but right, as right. you get, as you get big, deeper into it, like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Like what, how do I even know in the yes. first place yeah. this is from yeah. God, right? Like yeah. never mind scientific errors in the Quran, never mind like these things. Like, let's when go back did I start this. assuming that this, any of this is true anyways, right? Yeah, like yeah. why even assume any of it is true, right? And then start from there. Now you tell me why it's true. Mm. That's how it should be because anyways, that's called a burden of proof. I didn't know that. So yeah. I had some like basic issues at the time and, and I asked him and at the end of it, he basically answered some of them and the rest of them, he's like, I took a leap of faith. I didn't want to be wrong. I don't want to go to hell. So it was was his answer. That was some of the things he kind of gave me an explanation. Like, why did Muhammad do this? And he's like, kind of came up with something to kind of make me feel better about it. But the, the, some of the questions he just couldn't answer. He's like, you know what? I, 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 I contemplated deeply on it. And I decided it's not worth the risk. That's what he said. So Pascal's major basically. Right. And, and so I'm like, okay, thanks. We, I mean, we talked for like hours, like I was at his house. I don't know how many hours, but, and then I started posting on Facebook. <laughs> he's like, like, I'm happened? back, which is, he's like, I'm like, you didn't, he's like, I'm like, you didn't solve my issues. I still yeah. have questions about these things. It's not even have questions about these things. These are the issues I found in Islam. It's not question. Right. These are problems with Islam. Right. Yeah. And, and so, and he's like, I don't want to go back to this again. I'm like, I'm done. Like, I'm done with the doubts. I'm, I just want to be Muslim now, right? So I'm like, okay, don't worry. I won't bother you about it, right? right? But he kind of felt like I was being kind of like a nasty person in the sense that I'm misguiding others and I'm pulling others into the same hole that I'm I'm in. And he right. saw it as a hole, right? Right. Yeah, but, but, it's, it's, but, so, but one thing about ahead. this story, which is very interesting, is that a lot of, a lot of atheists point to uh, that, you know, you shouldn't poke holes in religion because then you're putting the burden of proof on you. You should just let them prove to, uh, prove their religion to you. And you should just sit back and say like, well, if you make a claim, you prove it to me. But psychologically, that doesn't usually work. Like, I think it, I, what I've noticed is that it starts with you point, most of the time at least, it starts with you pointing something out that they're like, hmm, yeah, well, how is this? 
why is this like this, right? I mean, it's true that the burden of proof is on them. And a lot of atheists like, no, don't. Why would you Why would you make a claim and put the burden of proof on you? You're at, you're at an advantage position. They're making the claim. They need to make, prove their claims, right? Uh, but yeah. but psychologically, it. what I've noticed is that even though it's true that the burden of proof is, is on them, if you point to some things, that's how initially it starts. And then once you have a few seeds of doubt, then people, then you go in with, well, how do you know the rest of it? They bring up the burden of proof and stuff. What do you think? Yeah. So that's a good, that's a very good question. I really like street epistemology or, you know, which is uh, Anthony Magna Bosco and it's based on a Socratic method, which is right. you know asking, right? Like why, why, why? And he has this interesting method where he goes out in public and just by asking questions, he gets people he first asked them, what's your, how, how strongly do you believe in this? Like if you're a Muslim, Christian, whatever, Jewish person, and Hindu, whatever. And then they'll say like, usually there's like 10 out of 10. And then they'll say, let me ask you some questions. And he doesn't tell them anything. He only asks them questions. And by the end, they're usually like 6 out of 10 now. Or 7 out of 10. Like, why do you believe this to be true? Oh, because blah, 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 blah. My parents told me. Okay, but like, what if, what if I asked you, what if someone else came to you and said, well, my parents tell me my religion is true. So how would you know which one is true now? Mm -hmm. They'd be like, hmm, good point. And this, this method, I think, takes a long time. And it's, but, but honestly, if you have like as much time as possible, like if you're talking to a loved one, like a spouse, like you're, like me talking to my wife, and you, you, you have that free discourse where there's no like time limit. I, I think that's the best method. And I do think like the burden of proof, the problem with the burden of proof thing, where, where you'd be like, okay, I don't want to discuss this. I want you to tell me why you believe Islam to be true. Usually, usually they think it's like a trick question. No, 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 no. I don't want to, I don't want to go that out. You're, you're trying to trick me. Or usually it starts question? with the whole like long story of like, just like, <laughs> you just have to, once you open that door, you just have to listen to a whole bunch of nonsense that you've already heard a million fucking times. Well, right? no, I, I think it's a good approach, but I think that a lot of times people will just, once it gets to a certain point, they just kind of stop you and they're like, uh, sometimes it gets to a good point where they'll be like, I saw a dream and Jesus came to me in a dream. And they're like, or they're like, it's personal. And then what do you say at that point? You're just like, okay, that's why you believe. And I, I don't believe because that's only for you. That, that reason only applies to you. It doesn't apply to me. Jesus never came to me in a dream. And so I can't, I don't think this is a reliable method, right? For determining the truth because you, dreams could be false too, right? Right. So, yeah. It's, I mean, uh, did no, you I mean, have any... Go, sorry, go, go ahead, Norman. No, I'm just no, no, saying no, that sometimes, saying. sometimes, um, I mean, they call it, they say that they're asking questions, the call it method, but sometimes you're basically saying something, you're just putting it in a question format, right? Like when I say, like, when I, when somebody says, like, well, it's a faith, it's faith, it's just based on my faith, it's not reason. And I say, well, don't you think if that was a reliable method, then all the other religions like Christianity and Hinduism should also use that method? Like if, if it was a reliable method, it wouldn't be giving you so much random different answers, right? But the thing is, like when you say, don't you think that, you're kind of like saying this, yeah. right? You're not, okay. <laughs> you're just putting it in a question yeah. format, yeah. Yeah. but you're actually but saying it, right? I feel the difference is that you are more likely to win over yeah. your opponent when you make them conclude, conclude yeah. themselves that you are right rather than you say, because I used to make that mistake before and I realized that it's not productive. Like I met one Muslim guy who was a good friend of mine and he's like, tell me why you don't believe. He really wanted to know. I'm like, I don't believe because of this and this and this and this. And I asked him, what do you think about this in the Quran? What do you think? And he's like, he was like so like overwhelmed with everything I was saying. He didn't have anything to say back to me. Mm. And it was just like the end of the conversation. Whereas I, I feel like if I would have asked him, like, why don't you tell me why you believe? And I'll give you some kind of feedback on that. Like, yeah, you're like, it doesn't have to be only questions. Right. You could say, well, you know, that's an interesting point. Mm. But is that really a reliable method? Basically, you're saying that's not a reliable method of knowing the truth or whatever. Right. But it, it, you get them to make the conclusion instead of you concluding. Because well, I mean, what you're doing is you're actually, by asking them, you are transferring the burden of proof to them in a very subtle kind of way. Yeah. Right? Because you're saying okay so i'm not gonna tell you what this i is think but here's, way. Okay. Right, right, you're, you're putting it in in, a, in the form of a question and then you're and and the other thing is it also disarms them it disarms them in the sense that you know you're asking hey what do you think i really want to know what you think i want to hear what you have to say right they right? don't Rather feel like than, you're preaching you know, to kinda, them they feel like you're they actually, don't, you're genuinely right. interested in their opinion instead right right so 
Yeah, that's, so that, that's I think I think that's where the utility of it is, and I I I think there's many ways to go around it. I've actually I think of the, that's sort of my approach that I've been doing for a very very long time when I'm speaking to people in person. I just didn't know what it was called. I didn't have a name for it. But but I had a so I had a question. A lot of times when we talk to people who left Islam, we've had you know a lot of people on this podcast. Um, they, you know, they they usually cite something that they read or some sort of outside influence. It seems like your journey or everything that you're talking about, these were internal doubts that came up. So you mentioned that that one guy who told you about the Jewish, the rabbis and the rabbinic, the, all those rabbinic stories from the Talmud and how they made their way into the Quran. So on. But is there a uh, uh, were there any other things that you read uh, before you made the conclusion that you were going to leave Islam or did you start discovering uh, or did you connect with anybody in the ex-Muslim community? Did you know there was such no. a thing? No, 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 no. So, I didn't even, no, not at all. Um, I think did you I think I, you'd I, find no, it or were you surprised? No, to find I, it I honestly think, no, I, well, I, things have changed a lot in the last few years. Uh, I, I know, yeah. You can't almost can't know, not know ex-Muslims now, but at that time, Yay. nobody was, <laughs> I don't think anyone was really talking about it to this level. No. And so this was all new to me. And, and to be honest, like a lot of the things which I looked into, they've become pu- publicly easily accessible. It's not like it's really new information. Like for example, the whole Alexander the, the Great connection to the Quran was done by a guy called Page, uh, was it Budge Page or something? In the in the like the seventies or like long ago, uh, maybe in this like you know many many years ago, and it was an Orientalist who found this connection, and and now you know the Mast Arab and other people have kind of made it easily accessible and consumable, mm-hmm. but like the the things were there. I just don't think it was common knowledge, and you know some of the issues that was finding now with academia, where you know the 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 Quran's narrative of being preserved is being challenged like never before because again it's not like a new thing it's not some people say oh you so you think you're so smart you ex-muslims you're coming up with these big claims against the quran it hasn't been preserved and this and that oh this has been you know debunked many years ago oh, but, but, but no but these the things yeah no no, not, no what was it's not common knowledge outside of academia the problems with the preservation of the Quran. I think you talked to Abdullah Gondal in more detail. He's more knowledgeable than me about this. It's just nobody knows. When I say nobody, I mean, I don't mean nobody. I mean the Muslim community as in the, the majority of Muslims, they don't know these things. So we're kind of like just like bringing it out and letting people, you know, hear about these things, basically. Yeah. And th- th- this is what we were, so we, we discussed this with Abdullah, the, the Abdullah Gondal as well. And this is what's kind of interesting is that uh, a lot of this has been around so I'll tell you, like you know, when you were writing, uh, when you were uh, in, uh, when when you left Islam in July 2015, that's around the time I was in the middle of my manuscript for my book. Oh, nice. yeah. And um, so I, that's when I really started reading about a lot of this stuff because it's when you read about the stuff, it's so I'd be researching something and then I'd go further and further. Then eventually I'd end up with the Berlin Encyclopedia of Islam, and I'd be getting. It was incredible. I went. I learned so much, and then some of the, so some of the things that I learned were. Um, for example, you know what you're saying about the rabbis, right? And this is very common knowledge in in mm. ac- in, in academia, as you said, yeah. is yeah. that when they when Muslims first wanted to get the hadith written down, which is you know over 200 years, all of them started over 200 years after Muhammad's death, is that when they wanted to write the hadith, they went to converted rabbis in Kufa, so people who had converted from from Judaism, oh, yeah. because they had the, the initial Isnads who transmitted the, uh, the who who started codifying and writing down the hadith, you know, they had experience with this stuff because the writing of the Talmud was a very similar process, right? So they actually went to them, and that's how a lot of the Jewish stuff that didn't make it into the Quran <laughs> made it into the hadith, right? Like circumcision and like stoning to death, and you know, then retrospectively, all these other stories came in, like you know, eaten by a goat, and you know, so it was. Um, so I find, and and all of this stuff is, and I found out there was a lot of stuff in academia that is actually very blasphemous, like that book Hagarism by uh, Patricia Crone, and and it, you know, and that had a huge impact in academia, and later they retracted a lot of parts of it, but um, nobody had ever talked about it outside. Why? Because it was just very volatile and very, you know, inflammatory material. So when Tom Holland wrote his book in the shadow of the sword, and he took a lot of this sort of stuff from academia and he put it out there, stuff that had been there for decades. But when he put it out there in the public, people lost their shit. It became a very, very controversial thing 
And uh, that's why it's been confined to academia. I have a question. So, uh, do you think that um, addressing, talking to Muslims and trying to get them to doubt uh, Islam is the method or the to- points that you bring up any different from talking to a Christian? Um, and if so, do you think somebody with the background or better understanding of Islam is more equipped to talk to Muslims and make them doubt, or basically anybody that with uh, so, with, with logic we should be able to address it? Yeah, go on. So, so it's actually a very good question, and yeah, that's the only thing I ask. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start by saying that clearly the guy that made me doubt in the beginning, and I was a religious believing staunch Muslim, but I was open-minded was someone that didn't know too much about Islam, but he knew a little bit of Islam. And I think the general level of knowledge has gone up a lot because of popular popularizers like the mass Arab and stuff like that. But, but yes, very much so someone that understands Islamic theology and, you know, to, to a certain level is much more equipped to be able to discuss with Muslims. Absolutely so. But in terms of your question about, you know, like I have a little bit of a hard time when I discuss the Bible because, I mean, I don't know the Bible, right? And if someone says, no, but the Bible actually doesn't mean that, you're like, um, I don't know the Bible. Like, I don't really, I can't even get to that. Right? I can't take it to that level. Right. Whereas with the Islamic scripture, like you, sometimes people are very intelligent and like Richard Carrier, for example, he did a debate with this Nadir guy, Ahmed. And even without, under, even without knowing the Islamic scripture, his knowledge of like history, his knowledge of science, it was phenomenal. And his logic, like his, he, he cut through the arguments, even when like his Muslim opponent said something like, no, 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 but the Islamic flood is, is a local flood, for example, like he made a claim. Mm. Now, you, his opponent doesn't know anything about whether it's a local flood or a global flood. And if he was talking to me, I'd be like, yeah, but no. why does the Quran say, oh, Allah, destroy all of the disbelievers on earth? Noah said that, right? Mm. So why does he say that then? If it's just a local flood, that doesn't even make sense. That doesn't add up, right? Mm-hmm. And they'll have to come up with a better way of kind of making sense out of that. But but Richard Carrier, even though he didn't know that, he came up with another response. And he said, well, even in this case, you know, the, 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 fl- and he came up with a response. He was able to deal with it. So yeah, you, if you're a smart guy or girl, whatever, you can kind of hold your own in any discussion, but, right. but knowing the scripture, knowing the particular flaws, knowing the weakest points, and we need to, we need to kind of pick on, you know, focus on our opponent's strongest points, not the weakest points right now. I'm kind of unpopular to some people because I say things that people don't like when I, sometimes I defend Islam. They think I'm defending Islam and that pisses off a lot of atheists. Like when I say Muhammad is not a pedophile, for example, and that really upset people. Like people get extremely angry at me and they say, how dare you defend this man who did these terrible things, whatever, whatever, whatever. And I'm just trying to to be pure evil. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. They, yeah, they, I think they, yeah, Armin does a lot of the same stuff. I, I actually no, like, say the same wait, thing when they call can him. Can you a clarify warlord. that? Because yeah. they think people think that they, we might see, say that. I, I mean, for example, Muhammad was very uh, pro taking care of orphans, right? Like that's yeah. Right? So if, yeah, the exactly. character. I mean, uh, but the, the reason why you don't call him a pedophile is because I think by definition, pedophiles are only attracted to children, right? Yeah, I, but I this mean, guy had like a whole yeah. bunch. Of, like he was attracted to Aisha, but he also had a whole b- bunch of wives that were not children. Right? Yeah, exactly. So he's I a think, child molester, but not a pedophile. I, I yeah, I think there's more to it than it. Like if we want, as a non-Muslim, right? You know, I'm not just looking at the hadith because the hadith say you know six and nine. But if you look at it as a historical figure. Which we don't Do we know. really know for sure if he was married to a, a child? I, I, and I don't know if we can say that for sure, for sure. And, and well, to be we're honest... We're talking about the character of Muhammad because we can't know anything for sure about Muhammad. We're talking about the Muhammad as, his, as canon is in Islam. Like the way I could talk about Voldemort, like even yeah. if he's not real, even if there was no... I mean, I'm not saying there was yes. no Muhammad. Even <laughs> if there was no Muhammad, we're not talking about the person. We're talking about the character as described in Islam. No, yes, but, uh, but, but I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Abdullah. No, you go ahead. I, I, you, have, you haven't spoken. No, about. no. I, I was going to say, but but as 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 we discussed, like the the only ever uh, the only thing that we really know about Muhammad that 
that is most likely true is the scant biographical detail in the Quran. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing else, no other biography, not the Hadith, everything else came. We don't even least... know about that. No, no, we don't, no, no, we don't. but yeah. I'm saying, that's what I'm saying. If, if, if there's anything that's likely, the only book that we have from his reported lifetime right. that is most likely, almost certainly from his reported lifetime is the Quran, right? Mm. That's actually, there's parchments that have been dated to that time and so on. So, so we know that that is We don't even time. know now if it was in Mecca. Like, this is how far we are no, from no, the no, you know, But that's what I'm saying, because the Quran isn't specific about Mecca, right? right. So, that's a, so I'm saying in the Quran, there's very, very scant biographical detail about Muhammad. There's almost none, yeah. right? So, so that's, that's really what we know, and that's nothing. Everything else about his life from... Everything in the Hadith was written over 200 years afterwards, okay? Mm -hmm. Everything, his first biography was compiled 100 years afterwards, the one that survives by Ibn Hisham. The one that that's based on didn't survive into, the, into uh, today. Yeah, yeah. And that was written over 150 years afterwards. So we, we, so I think, uh, 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 am I getting you right? Is that what you're trying to say in the sense that... We, I mean, you know, yeah, I, and, I, and I, I, do, I do think that there's better arguments to make on this very specific topic. For example, the Quran in 65.4 allows, you know, basically divorce of exactly, women yeah. Yeah, that you had sex with were below the age of purity. So, I mean, that's an argument that's worth making, not whether the historical fact is he married a child, which is, it's very disputable. There's so many arguments you can make against it. Like the fact is he only had one, if he did, had one child wife. All his other wives were, you know, Older teens, let's say, and older, and and so he it's it's he only hard. raped one child. It's hard to make. It's it's much more difficult to make this argument, and and it turns away people. But, but it, it doesn't, doesn't. I mean, that's not what we. I mean, okay, I'm going to defend people that make this argument, okay? Because we are not making that claim about the historical Muhammad. We don't know what the fuck was the historical Muhammad doing, okay? Uh, we're uh, what I'm t the Muhammad that I'm referring to when I'm criticizing Muhammad is the Muhammad that Muslims believe in. Yeah, the Muhammad that them, is canonized in Islam. That's the Muhammad. Many, I'm, yeah, and 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 I feel like even that is changing. There's many Muslims now that are refusing to say that he, you know, she was six and nine. Like, um, you know, it's a kind of reform too, I guess. To uh, to say that she was actually older. Now, um, right. But again, like if you go to academia. Right. Yeah. Again, the, the challenge is like that he was married to a 19 year old. And this is coming also from academia where they, they're looking at the life events that happened and like, you know, going back to, to calculate the age rather than so just by throwing out the authentic hadith. Then. They're throwing out the authentic hadith and academia does that. Academia throws out the authentic hadith. Okay, but, they this, don't is, believe but the hadith. this is not the, this is not the Islam that we know. No, 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 but they, they also throw out the biography. Things. Academia. No, also the biography, the bio throwing out the biography is fine. Nobody ever said that that's authentic. I mean, nobody, like that. No, no, but uh, academia looks at the hadith and the biography is yeah, the same but, because but the, no, not, but, both but, of them were but the, orally but transmitted, the most, right? Mo most Islamic schools, they, they don't claim that the biographies are authentic 100%. They only yeah, claim yeah. that about Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, right? More than anything else, right? Well, so based on. Based on most Islamic schools of thought, these are the sources of hadith based on Sunnis, and Shias have their own hadith. And based on no, no, Shias you're right. Well. You're right about that. But we're talking about academia. So in academia, right? In most in Al Azhar University, yeah, it's going to be that. If you go to Qom, oh, it's going to be real academia. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. we're not. <laughs> okay. Qom and Al Azhar are not real academia. Okay, okay. okay I'm talking about Islam. Okay, I'm talking about yeah, Islam. Yeah. Okay, so. According to Islam, as what we know as Islam, I'm not talking about Muslims because Muslims they make Islam whatever they whatever their Islam is not as really Islam. Their Islam is just basically what they want to Islam to be, right? And most Muslims don't want their prophet to, don't want to have a inconvenience of having a prophet that fucked a nine year old, right? So they're okay, like, so well, yeah, go on. So this topic is how to talk with how to engage with Muslims. My perspective, right is this is a counterproductive argument that turns away people that has no right. actual success, in my opinion. In no, my yeah, perspective, yeah. I agree with that. It's, I don't... it's a useless argument that you won't win because there's so much, like you've taken the biggest guns that they have. <laughs> you, you know, for example, Jonathan Brown. Lewis Hanging Fruit. And for example, Yasser Qadi and Hamza Yusuf. 
And the biggest guns have like this, like <laughs> shooting down this argument. So you're wasting your time on like this, this heavy muscles on the other side that are like pushing back against this argument, saying it's historical this. And, you know, at that time, people were, you know, used to get married younger and this and that. Mm. And there's no point. There's no value because you're, you're just they're just going to get mad so at you I, and stop listening when I you say this. You know, I, I got to disagree with you. I'm going to disagree yeah. with you a little bit. I know some so people heard- that when they when they looked into the headbeast and saw this, they were like, yeah, I'm not yeah. okay with this. I, I And the reason I'll disagree with you on, on this is this. That um, when I talk to ex-Muslim women, and this, so there have been over the last ten years, and, and this is this is one of those topics wh- when I guess I started speaking out initially. This is one thing that I was very vocal about, and I was very convinced by the people around me, especially my family, that you know we shouldn't talk about this because this is just something that turns people off immediately. So I kind of backed off on it too. But then when I started meeting ex-Muslims, and this didn't happen until at least for quite a while because for a while I was just writing and mouthing off and I hadn't really met a lot of ex-Muslims. But then suddenly when they started appearing and they came out, and especially all the women, when I came, this is one of the most common reasons I've heard mm. from young women, right? Sp- sp- w- women who, they just get, they're like, I just can't, can't deal with that. How, how, why did he marry a nine-year-old? Like, and they became ex-Muslim. No, mar- no married a six-year-old. Uh, married a six-year-old. Uh, yeah, but I mean, the, the, the way that they say it in the common parlance so, is always... So, so this is, that's yeah, an ahead. interesting point. That's an interesting point. And maybe because I'm more engaged with the counter, the dawah and the counter dawah, mm, the counter yeah. apologetics, I've seen like the responses to this and people that are more like religious Muslims that are like have read some of the responses, have heard some of the responses, they're not, they're not phased by that because they're like, well, we can explain it in other ways. Like, you know, this was the way of life back then or this was, so yes, there's definitely going to be some people that are like, but that's interesting to know. I didn't. I'm. I'm. So, I'm yeah. surprised to hear no, that. I mean, they like, do. So people, people do have. By this. No, no. They, they do have. They. Uh, they do have those arguments. So, so I heard them all. That you know, okay. in, in the in Arabia, uh, girls used to menstruate earlier. Yeah. Um, at that time, they they were looking at the Islamic calendar years, and there were these calculations. She was actually 19 years. So I come from an ethnic ethnic, ethnic Shia, Shia background where they're trying to reform this like crazy. Yeah. So I brought out actually Tahrir al Vasile, which is a, a book for, by Khomeini. Uh, the fourth volume of it, which for some reason is very hard to get, but I have the entire thing in uh, Arabic and, and in PDF, the original one that he wrote. I got it from my book because I wanted to prove that he said this. So he actually said that, uh, Khomeini said that uh, you're allowed to have sex with a girl. Uh, you're allowed to have uh, get sexual pleasure from a child uh, that is a nursing baby. Yeah. So, you know, he said, that, you know, you can do intracrural sex, which is thighing. Um, you can fondle them. There's, there's all these things, and he said that based but on he could be a fucking infant, and an then. infant. That's so he said this with Khomeini, and then so in in my extended family, like we grew up when we grew up, my extended family had pictures of Khomeini on the wall, right? Wait, so, what? You had Khomeini? You guys were related to Fadi? I, I never knew that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Pakistan, in Pakistan, a lot of them. We're talking wow. about the eighties. This is so the eighties. So like, did Khomeini manage to get to this far uh, into Pakistan? <laughs> Everybody, listen, everybody who was Shia around the world okay. loved Khomeini because Khomeini was the, first of all, he stuck it to the US. So that was one thing. The other thing is this was 19, this happened in 1979. I'm talking about the early 80s, mid 80s. Hey, 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 we need to do this. Right, we no. need to have an entire podcast about this, but go on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But but I, I just, so I just want to tell you this because this is related to it. So, so when uh, I grew older and when I found this and then I showed it to a lot of the people, I actually posted it on Facebook and then it became a meme. And everything, but uh, when I when I got the quote, um, and I have all of the legit sources for it, it's actually still on the on Khamenei's website. This book is still on there, and you can still find this uh, this thing. Khamenei? And I have screenshots of it. Khamenei's website, right. official, the Khamenei.ir. So, so the, the so when I found this, they they were absolutely shocked, and that kind of showed to me how hard they're trying to dispute this. It's one of those things where, you know how, uh, you know, that now they're saying that Muhammad was a first feminist. This is a revisionist sort of historical edit, right, that they've done, where they've retrospectively gone in. And because now we have these new secular values and we have to make that fit in. So Muhammad became the first feminist. And I always joke, I'm like, you know, 50 years from now, they're going to say Muhammad was a first gay rights activist because <laughs> like everyone's going to, everyone's going to accept gay rights and then be like, well, oh, Muhammad accepted it all along. So yeah, but th- these retrospective edits happened. All of the arguments about, um, Aisha being older, they're all from the last century. And a lot of them yeah. are from uh, non-Arab uh, scholars, right, who have tried to 
uh, revise this in some way or another. But yeah. I, I have, but I, I'm telling you, I think that the one of the most, and this actually includes me too. One of the biggest things that I had a problem with was this marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, the the majority of ex-Muslim women that I know, and my my wife is a she deals with a lot of uh, a she deals with a lot of ex-Muslim female activists, especially from mm-hmm. Pakistan and the subcontinent. And uh, we hear from them all the time yeah. that this is almost probably the number one right. reason but, that, but they, me, that they. But let me let me t- make um, your Abdullah's point in a different way because maybe maybe not about this one because first of all I think we should all we should try everything right I mean yeah. what works with some people doesn't work That's with other true. people right right yeah uh, mm-hmm. but I mean but but at the same time I think what we say about Islam. Sometimes, and I think, Abdullah, you might disagree with me on here because I, I think you commented on this. Um, sometimes we're not trying to, uh, sometimes the goal is to make Muslims doubt their religion. And sometimes it's to make a point that you don't get to tell us that we can't say this. Do you know what I mean? Oh. So, for example, mm-hmm. when I had the Allah is gay oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. sign, that's the, people are like, how is this going to help people out of the religion? I was like, yeah, that wasn't what I was trying to do there. Right, and I think you disagreed me with me when I was when I did a Quran burning. Right? Yeah. The Quran. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Go on. I guess I, I guess it depends on your goals and stuff. And I'm not so much into that kind of free speech kind of discussion as much as you guys maybe. Right, right. Especially you. I'm. I have a very specific intent in what I'm doing, which is to help. I wouldn't even call it make Muslims doubt. I would call it help Muslims to see that Islam is not true. I mean, from my well, perspective, that's they more can, than they can choose. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, I, I'd be happy if people see that Islam is false and they don't waste their lives on something that's not true. Because, I mean, that's one thing I can do with my life that'll help people, right? Because it helped me and it made my life materially better, right? So, but of course, there's other reasons why people do things and there's other goals that you may have, mm. uh, which may conflict in sometimes with my goals. You know, my ma- main goal is this and you and my main goal might be a little bit different. And so there's I mean, other. I have that goal as well. I just yeah. I, like when I when 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 a Muslim comes to me and asks, well, "Why don't you believe in uh, God, or why don't you why why did you leave Islam?" I'm gonna tell them, "Well, Allah is gay." <laughs> that's like, <laughs> I'm not gonna burn a Quran in front of them, right? That's not gonna obviously that's not gonna work. But yeah. but if people tell us that we can't burn the Quran. I yeah. think that it makes sense to burn a Quran, but but do you disagree with that still? Like uh, based on the fact that the point was uh, to challenge taboos, to challenge uh, limits on free speech. Do you disagree with that? Uh, well? I I I okay. So I'll tell you. Okay, so I in the interview of Sam Hiss with uh, Peter Singer, he's a utilitarian uh, ethicist, mm-hmm. and. Um, what what surprised me was when Sam Hiss asked him a similar question and he said, do you think we should stop making Muhammad cartoons, draw Muhammad Day or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, Peter Singer was like, well, like, look at the consequences. And, you know, being a consequentialist and being a utilitarian, he's like, look at, you know, the, 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 the mobs and the killings and, the, you know, people dying and, you know, the protests and the boycotts of like Danish cheese and all these people losing their jobs and this and that. And Sam Harris was a little bit taken back and, you know, he kind of like challenged him a bit on it and said, like, mm. well, we shouldn't. And then the conclusion was kind of like, we shouldn't stop doing it because of that. And we shouldn't let them bully us into stopping because they're going to like burn, burn the streets down or whatever. And I had a Facebook kind of uh, poll about this and it was it was like 50 50 where people like 50 percent. I, I even asked if draw Muhammad Day would lead to World War Three. <laughs> Would you still support it? And it was like 50 50. And I voted no. Mm. I said, no, I wouldn't do it. Because, well, like, yeah, I mean, I'm I, practically speaking, I value my life more than, of course, like, drawing Muhammad or something. So it, it depends. It's, it's just a, it's, it's a weighted cost benefit analysis that everybody has to make. And yeah, but the, I, but the reason why no, I support it is because I don't think it's going to relate to World War Three, <laughs> And I think that, in fact, uh, if, if protests, if the fact that they did a protest was successfully shut that down, that's going to encourage more pro- like not well, it wasn't just protest. It was just like um, the barbarism that was res- like I don't have anything against protests. Yeah, the barbarism yeah. that was in a response to that. Yeah, the violence. That, the violence. If that worked, 
you're encouraging more of it. It's not yeah. like if it works, they're just going to sit back and like, okay, now we're happy. <laughs> they say, okay, this is a very useful tool. Let's, what, let's see what else we could get them to shut the fuck about, right? Yeah. Well, so if, that's, that's well I, have, I have something else. But another add, thing add is that this. he was proven wrong because look, we had a Jai Muhammad Day annually now. We do yeah. it more than we ever did before. And we, they, it, we desensitized Muslims. Look yeah. at the first, right. the, the reaction to it is not as much as it used to be. Right. Uh -huh. We say like, oh, you want us to stop drawing Muhammad? This is an annual event now. Everybody's doing it. Look at the reaction to it. Is that nearly as much as it, it backfired? It doesn't so, work. If you, if you, if you respond to it is like, okay, we're not going to do it anymore. Then they're going to go after something else. If the response to it is that we're going to do it now 10 times, 10,000 times more, they're going to see that this is not going to, this is not an effective way to shut people up. But go yeah. I have yeah. So this is uh, that I think Armin, what you're saying at the end, that's the part I agree with. So Abdullah, I'm kind of like you. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fan of like uh, the burning Qurans or or drawing even drawing Muhammad and everything. It's not totally my thing. Just in terms of taste, that's not something that I would do. But I have you been. Draw Muhammad? I uh, yeah. No, I mean, I but I do uh, encourage this now. And the reason I encourage, it, I'll give you the example. Like you know, with Trump, right? Trump came up, everyone's like, we're not going to normalize this. It's not going to be normal presidency or whatever. But the thing is that even the really shitty things he's done, he goes out and he does it so often that it, it has become normalized. So when people get desensitized to things, they start thinking, okay, this is normal. This is routine. I remember when the Danish cartoons first came out in 2006, um, I had not seen anything like that in major publications, like where I could actually Google it. And I actually saw that first figure of the, with the with the bomb in his turban. I was like, "Holy shit! Yeah. This guy really put himself out there." I remember being shocked. Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah. and I remember when I was in high school, and I got shocked when I was very shocked when Salman Rushdie wrote that book because I didn't even think it was conceivable. Right. But, yeah. but uh, what happened is that um, over time, now when you Google, I mean, mom cartoons are. They're, they're nothing. They're just yeah. like all over the place. It, yeah. they, nobody so make, knows make, who to kill. Normalize burning the Quran. Normalize having Girl science. For that. Normalize huh? having science saying Allah is gay. And actually, Armin, when you burned the Quran, actually, I have to give you credit. There are a couple of Qurans that you showed that you didn't burn. Like he's like, oh, well, I've got this Quran. I don't know what you said. He said, this is my rainbow Quran. So I'm, I really like this one. And then I, I was it one of them that you actually kissed. No. Or something? I don't know. No, it wasn't. Okay. That was another book. No, I had, I, I I had three Qurans. And then, I burned the cheapest one. There was an expensive <laughs> one with the tough he, he said, I don't want to burn this because this one's expensive. <laughs> and, and, and Armin has also said many times that he likes the own? Quran. Yeah. Like he enjoys reading the Quran now that he's not Muslim. Right. So right. that's all. It's, so Armin has a, he's kind of, he has a much more sort of nuanced approach to this. I but I do. Uh, I also where, where I a do, lot of people say, "Well, why would you burn paper? You're committing to like you're doing. We have global warming, and you're doing carbon. And so, so I donated ten dollars, which uh, to offset my yes, carbon footprint, <laughs> and it actually was that was like one ton of worth of uh, carbon uh, emissions. So oh, I was cool. like, this is way more than what I'm burning today. So I basically addressed every single problem. People say this is censorship. I basically said, look, my phone has a lot of free Quran apps. <laughs> uh, like there's, this is not going to limit what? anyone's access to the Quran. It, it, uh, it was the most sophisticated Quran burning video I've ever seen. <laughs> First of all, he's burning it very carefully on his barbecue. I right? <laughs> and people and say People also said this is hateful. I said, look, I have my own book, Why There Is No God. I'm burning a few pages of that as well. He if burned his own book as yeah, well. Yeah, I said, if it's hateful, and, then I'm being hateful to myself. <laughs> <laughs> right? and, then, and then, yeah, and, and he's got, so so he says he likes the Quran. He keeps the expensive one. He keeps the uh, the rainbow one. He burns a couple of his own pages. He burns the other one. Then he gives a sophisticated sort of, uh, the, this, uh, I was, this the, a little bit of a discourse on, uh, what this is all about? It was really it was, it was like the Arrested Development uh, episode version of the Quran burning. I don't know if you guys have seen that show. Some of you Wait, might get the. No. Never mind. It's yeah. a it's a TV show. He also it's said this is what Nazis I'm used to do. Man. So why would you do what Nazis or fascists used to do? I said, well, when the Nazis did that, it would, they were trying to limit people. First of all, this is my own Quran. I didn't take anyone else's Quran, right? When they were burning books, they were burning other people's books. They were doing burning other people's property. I'm burning my own property. Second of all, they when they were burning the books, they when they were burning books, they were trying to limit people's access to information. When when we burn the Quran, people might actually wonder what's in this that 
that these people don't like about it so much. They actually might encourage more people to read the Quran, right? And at that point, like any they, publicity is good publicity. Yeah, I mean, th- at that uh-huh. point, the so- books were the main source of storing educational material. Right now, they're not, right? right? So books are I, not. Yeah, go on. I guess my my response to that is, I mean, for one thing, for sure, I agree that you know we should not negotiate with terrorists. Right. You don't. You don't like. You don't give in to someone when they point a gun at you because you just well, I can't. Would, I, would, I, would, I, would, I mean, I don't mean <laughs> literally. Yeah. Okay, I mean, yes. If someone points a gun, lots of those girls in the. Uh, oh, never mind. Forget it. I was but but say. yeah. My, but I mean that aside. Even though I de- I do agree with the principle of like not you know, giving into terrorism in any way. I mean, in this case, it's literal terrorism because the burning and whatever, the right. trying to scare people. I, I don't even mean in that extreme case. We don't give in with people like that. Right. But I just feel like it, in my case, you know, what, with what I'm trying to do and right. trying to achieve, it leaves, a di- it leaves a distaste in my mouth and it kind of, you know, creates this bigger divide between us and them. You know, it, sometimes... Yeah, that's I how can't... I feel. I, yeah. that's a, right. Okay, I'm going to prove you guys. I'm going to tell you guys that this is wrong. When I was and, in- and one more thing, one more thing. So sometimes I cross the line, and th- this is the thing. I'm saying all these things, but sometimes I cross the line too. Like I've I've made posts on Facebook that like really pissed off people, especially when I'm being like sarcastic and joking around. Right. And I've said things like, I one thing it was so harmless too. I just said instead of saying Bismillah, I say Yaba Daba Do, and it works just as well. And this actually really pissed off a few people, including one loyal Muslim friend of mine. Right. And I don't know if you guys know this guy Mubin Sheikh. He's a uh, he's kind of anyways. He's well known in the community, and he was going to have an Islamic discussion with me. After this, he blocked me, and it was so pissed off because. Mm. Anyway, sometimes I piss off Muslims too. Like I, I'm not trying to say I'm so I'm so holy and I I'm so nice and I never piss off you. I do. I upset people, and it's well, it's okay I mean, to upset the, the, people. The right? very nature of what you're saying is, I think that's the thing. Yeah. I really, I think it's a matter of taste when it comes to right yeah, and wrong. Yeah. I have to say, and I I learned this really from and I've, I'm mentioning her a lot today because I guess maybe it's the Ismaili connection or maybe it's that sure. we're talking yeah. about how to engage with Muslims, but yeah. there's a huge contrast in the way that my wife deals with this stuff and the way that I deal with it. And yeah. and my wife is extremely, she's more like Armin is in the sense that mm-hmm. she's, she's much more aggressive, totally in your face. She's I'm like the, aggressive the, when I'm talking to Muslims, <laughs> you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like when oh, I'm, no, no, talk, I mean, when I, yeah, I'm agree, you know, okay. I'm really like, out, it's not you know, a bad thing, Arvin. It's a compliment. No, no, no. Aggressive, like when I'm. I mean, it's not like when I'm talking to a Muslim. I'm telling them, like you know, they. It, <laughs> I, 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 I talk to them very in a very polite way. They, yeah. they, a lot of them come thinking that I'm going to be like hateful, and then once they have a conversation with me, they actually love, become my friends. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, the conversation when when a Muslim is in front of me, I'm not going to be rude to them in any way. Obviously, like I'm, mm-hmm. I mean, I be aggressive when it comes to the ideas, but you can still be aggressive, uh, aggressively attack people's ideas in a polite way. Being aggressive, yeah. yeah. I mean, not holding. Yeah, but, I, but yeah, yeah. That, that's kind of what I'm getting. I think that when I when I mean in your face, I don't necessarily mean like super, super aggressive. I mean, right. assertive and trying, getting your point across in a much more blunt way. Yeah, right? so, yeah, that's so, Yeah. So, okay, so th- let's reword it that way. So, so it's more of a, um, it's more of the Malcolm X approach versus the Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King approach. And the thing is, both of those are important. Both of them had a huge part to play and different things work on different people, right? So, uh, and, and I have I, noticed that these can things I, work Can on I people. tell you why you guys are wrong when you're saying <laughs> that you might actually turn off some people that they're not going to talk to you? That's so wrong because first of all, when I, for example, did the uh, I, I Love Is Gay video, I wasn't even trying to... Uh, reach oh. out to Muslims, it was more of a free speech. Wait, wait, wait. But just a clarity, I don't think that it's a d- the deterrent isn't that we're going to turn off people. Like, we're going to turn off people no matter what we do. <laughs> right. I think yeah, it's, what I'm saying is that it's more of a matter, a matter of taste. Like, some people find something Yeah, I understand. That's but, more but I, I think Abdullah made the point that you might lose some people, some, lose some Muslims that uh, they might have talked to you before, right? Yeah, but, not, yeah. But you're let, creating let me, a bigger gap, right? That's what I feel. But that's not the case. Let me make my point. Let okay. me make this point. I'm, but I know, even though I wasn't trying to reach to Muslims to talk to, I do that with different ways, right? I, I do reach out to Muslims. I do talk to a lot of Muslims, but this was not the goal of the Allah's gay video. The Allah's gay video is like, you don't get to tell us what the, fu- what the fuck to say. And also to highlight how homophobic the Islam- Muslim community is, uh, and also to break taboos and all, all the other stuff. But the thing is that I have now more Muslims in my inbox that want to talk to me and ask me why I'm an ex-Muslim because of the video than ever before. 
You know what I mean? Like a lot of Muslims wow. found me, and that, that's got, that's exactly that's what I've seen too. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. But like they're not like they don't want to kill you. They're like they're happy to talk oh, to no, you. No, no, okay. they do. No, they do. No, I, yeah, all of that. Uh, we want. There are Muslims that want to bring me back to Islam. There are Muslims that want to kill me. There want. There are Muslims that want to rape my wife. There are Muslims. No, no, but specifically for this Allah's gay video, like right. didn't you get a more hostile response? Would you say than average or not the same? Like compared um, to like bring, bring the Quran. Allah's gay. Don't you get? Don't you bring out like? Don't you get like more fanatics after you for those topics rather than like? I get both. I get oh. I get Muslims that want to kill me. Yeah. I want to. I get a lot of Muslims that want to po- talk to me politely. Oh, okay. I get Muslims that apologize for the Muslims that want to kill me. <laughs> yeah, I get that too. <laughs> right? I get that too. Uh, yeah. Why are you apologizing? He didn't want to kill me, right? Uh, I get Muslims that want to kill me, but then after I talk to them, now they want to talk to me, right? Nice. Uh, so. But the thing is that for every Muslim that might have talked to me and now they don't want to talk to me, I get a hundred Muslims that now actually want to talk to me. Do you know what I mean? Really? Really? And, and here's the thing. So here's an Armin. I'm, I, I'm almost sure that you've gotten this too. Okay. But what you see is that even the from the ones that want to kill you, um, strangely, sometimes you hear from them two years down the line, three yes. years down the line, depending yes. on how much. So Armin, you've gotten that, right? Because I know yeah. Alishma's gotten this a lot. Uh, there's people who have, and I've mentioned this on the podcast before, they've written to me and they've said, can you tell your wife to unblock me? I had a huge argument with her three years ago and I was defending myself, but now I think like you, now I'm an ex-Muslim. So like the <laughs> testimonials that you were talking about, yeah. these are they're the initial immediate testimonials where people yeah. like listen to it, the rational people. And then there's others that are like, why the fuck did you do this? And then they go and they, they get really pissed off and then you know they have this argument, then they go back and they're forced to think, then they go and they read up about things because they're getting defensive. And then two years later, they come back and they're like, you know but, what? And I was there. Yeah, and that happens even, but, amazingly and, often. But I'm surprised Ali, even that, more than that, even more than that, even the Muslims uh-huh. that even there's even more examples of Muslims that don't leave Islam, but they come and say like, I'm going to find you. I'm going to fucking kill you. Right. And then you talk to them politely. They don't even, even if they don't leave Islam and you talk to them and you're like, well, why do you want to kill me? Like, what did I do wrong? Then they change it. Like, you know what? Um, Sorry, I was very emotional. I didn't mean to be. Um, yeah. You got a death threat that, from them. That's right, too. And then, and then yeah. that just happened to me last week. Yeah. And then, <laughs> like, you know, you have to understand that Muhammad is like a mother to us, or Allah is so dear to us, so close to us. It's worse than seeing. It's They, they come up with the weirdest example. It's worse than watching your you mother being raped Muhammad in front like of you. Is like a mother to us? No. Yeah. Like, no, basically, yeah, they it's say like, like you're insulting my mother. Not a, yeah. mo- not a mother to you. Like, like, you know how much you love your mother? For us, Muhammad is even be- bigger and greater yeah. than that. Like, oh, when you insult Allah, is is like it's worse than seeing your own mother being raped in front of you. It's always like <laughs> female and rape, female and rape, these examples that they come yeah. up with. Right? The threats is also a lot of like, <laughs> okay. rape, yeah. But Strange. yeah, you don't you guys don't you guys get threats to to? Yeah, no, no, no. I, I've been. I've, daughter, I've we're gonna that. rape your daughter. We're gonna rape your sister. Yeah, we're rape your yeah. I've, I've gotten. I got mm-hmm. one where, well, the kind of stuff they say about your kid, like, you know, they want to play. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. I, but anyway, you go, I yeah. haven't got any in a long time. Well, I get, I, it was like really bad when I first came out. Now I don't, I don't really get any. I once, once in a while now. Can you, they, they, they are less frequent. They are. I, they're I, not, I, yeah, they're very much so. Five years frequent. ago. Because they see five. that we screenshot them and post them. And <laughs> no, no, Armin, it's right. because of what you're making, the point you're making about the burning Quran and Allah's gay thing. It's been normalized. Ex-Muslims are normalized. People know right. about them. And it's then the reformers not come to... and take credit for it. Like we're normalizing shit and people are like, oh, look, the Muslim community is reforming. Like, yeah, no, thanks to you. No, it's, it's ex-Muslims are causing people to right. go moderate and reform. It's not really the reform people that are making people right. ex-Muslims. Yeah, it's the other way around. So Wait, it's a, it's it's really I, I I haven't really figured out and I haven't put my finger on exactly what's going on, but there's been an amazing acceleration of this stuff. And again, I'm I'm saying this is somebody like I started writing for Half Post in 2008, so it's been like it has been exactly 10 years, and I've been talking about this stuff. For, and the way that it has changed just in the last I think maybe three years mm. or so has been incredible the way that ex-muslims have just mushroomed out of uh, everywhere and you know uh, abdullah like when you when we started talking and i was telling you how much i loved you and all of that in our private messaging which i I did and so i went up and i noticed that you had messaged me before like a very long time ago yeah i had missed that and uh 
No, like practically yeah. speaking, when you get like a lot of people contact you, you 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 miss more, right? So I mean that happened. But yeah, I wanted to get in touch with you. I wanted to meet you, but somehow I didn't get a chance to actually end up meeting you. But yeah, we'll do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're gonna do it. Right, so I, have, I have more questions yeah. right away before we get to patron questions. Yep. Okay, so what do you say to Muslims that, um, like, let's say an ex-Muslim, an average ex-Muslim is talking to Mus- uh, and a Muslim about why Islam is wrong and blah blah blah, and then the Muslim and comes to like, well, what's what's your, um, you know, what's your academic background in the Islamic studies? What's your credentials? How, uh, if you want, if you have a problem with Islam, tell me the level of education that you have in Islamic scholarship, like as a way to try to undermine their credibility and uh, them talking about Islam. Uh, what would you say? Um, how would you say that the ex-Muslim should respond to something like that? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I do get that sometimes. And uh, people will say, and, and it, I mean, really it's a double standard, right? Because when you, when you join Islam, <laughs> There's no expectation that you need to know anything. And you just like blindly believe now that Muhammad is the messenger of God and Allah is, you know, the Lord of the universe um, based on maybe something that sounded nice or some similarity to your previous religion of Christianity or Ismailism to Sunnism in my case. But like when you leave Islam, suddenly you need to have a PhD, you need to know <laughs> Arabic, you need to know like the inside out. Mm. And I think like the Quran. So just, does to make your, just to make your point, you're saying like, why, why do they have the standard? They, you have to be a fucking scholar to be able to leave Islam, but they yeah. don't have the same standards when somebody wants to join Islam. But yeah, go on. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I think the Quran does a good enough job all by itself, even without the Hadith, of, of showing you that it's not from the creator of the universe. Right. And I think it's clear enough that I don't need to tell anyone that I'm an Islamic scholar. I can just point out some simple things that people can look up for themselves. Right? And, right. and at the end of the day, everyone has to decide what they want, to, if they have the, you know, the courage to leave Islam when the when the holes are shown to them, right? You know what right. I'm saying? That takes some courage. That takes some balls, some guts yeah. to like actually, you know, say like, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe all these years I've been following something that's actually not true. Right. And that's difficult because I, it's sometimes I ask myself that, like, I'm like, I'm not like the most smartest guy. How is it that I was able to find my way through it? And I see some people that are much more intelligent than me. And they're still Muslim. And I, I, and, I, and I thought about it. I'm like, at some point, it comes down to courage, right? It, at some point, there's also some like matter-of-fact things that happen in your life. That Self-reflection. You. Yeah, and, and some things make you, like, like sometimes personal trials in your life will make you doubt and will make you think about these things. Like I know a guy that, a very good friend of mine, that his marriage broke down and he got divorced. And that actually made him like self-reflect a lot. And eventually he left Islam, not because he was blaming God or anything like that, but it made him look into everything in his life. And then he found, you know, found the holes in Islam and he left Islam. For me, I didn't have that issue happening. But I mean, it, it, it sometimes it's just a spark, right? So, and, but you need the courage to really, like, to really look into it and to see that maybe I'm wrong, right? So he, he did um, one thing. So that was a very good response. Um, one thing I yeah. would usually say is that I don't need uh, I don't I don't need to be an expert in witchcraft and wizardry to know that that's bullshit, right? Uh, yeah, I would never say that. Yeah, that's a, I would <laughs> but, say leprechaunology, but, like the the I think it was a Richard Dawkins thing that you don't have to know everything about leprechaunology to reject. Another point. Uh, yeah. Another another two points that I I actually asked this in the in the group ex Muslims of North America, and I got some good responses that I heard. Uh, before, but you reminded me to bring this up as well, is that Muhammad himself was, uh, you know, didn't have any education. He couldn't even read and write, right? And um, another thing is that the Quran itself mentions that this is a clear message. You know, it, there's a verse message that is, you know, this is a very clear and obvious message. So it should be, be like, it, 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 if people think that you need to be a scholar to be able to decode the Quran, it goes against the universality of the message uh, for it to be for all men, for all time. Uh, it yeah. makes it a very, you know, so those are other points to bring up. That That's another very good point. And I've, I've even heard a Muslim scholar, Hamza Yusuf, say that atheists have a higher standard of God. And like he was kind of, 
he was in a, he was doing a good thing. He was trying to build some empathy for our position, and he was saying Muslims need to understand sometimes it's that they. I mean, he was saying we're wrong, but still, he's like it's coming from a good place. Like we're trying to say, well, why would God allow these things, or why would God make these mistakes, right? And so, right. you know, it's true. I mean, why do we hold God to such a low standard? That he's like such an idiot that he couldn't like even get his book right. He right. couldn't like find a better way of preserving it. He couldn't make the message without have without these like issues that so many issues that we're finding right. So that right. that's another good point, right? Right, right. And what do you say to people that say that why are you talking to av- like average Muslims that don't really understand mm-hmm. Islam instead of talking to sc- <laughs> to, I, like, to scholars? Yeah, yeah. What do you say? I get accused of that too. I get accused of oh, you're just misguiding all the dumb Muslims, basically, right? <laughs> like, all the ones that don't know there's a religion, right? And I. I, I don't really know what to say to that because I, I, I think you don't need to be an expert on Islam to see its faults. I mean, back to what you said, you don't need to know everything in the religion. You just need uh, one mistake in the Quran and it's done. Yeah, you, <laughs> and how much, do you, how much do you need to know about Nordic mythology to reject it? <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. How much do you need to know about, uh, like the, the, these people, they've all rejected Hinduism. Mm, None yes. of them have read about it. They don't. Yeah. They haven't read the the the, the Vedas or any, any oh, yeah, of the scriptures. Of Hinduism, to bring up. Right? They haven't read. They they've rejected all of these other faiths. They've rejected all of the ancient mythologies without knowing like Greek mythology, without knowing Greek. They've rejected like oh, there's the, so many different. Uh, no, but, uh, the, but, the, but this is a different. Argument, this so. is a different point than the first one. This is like you're going after Muslims that don't know their religion. And trying to make them ex-Muslim, but these are like not people that are really good at understanding their own religion. You should just you go should go after like you're basically going after low hanging well, fruit. Okay, okay, yeah. good good question. So, I would love like like me personally, I would absolutely love to have a discussion with like like a proper Islamic scholar. Nobody wants to talk to us. Okay, and I say nobody. I don't mean nobody. But there's a few people that will are willing to kind of do this. I'm going to debate ex-Muslims thing, but like the rest of them, it's honestly not in the favor to acknowledge us at this point. So right. what they do is they talk about us, but they don't talk to us. Right. But like we're not running away. Like I'm happy to have a discussion with a Muslim scholar and let's talk about it. Like, and I think some people are actually like MTS Shams is a good example of someone that's building these bridges. Right, and it's it's kind of getting inroads into the Muslim community. Uh, former able guest to, on the podcast, by the way. Former guest, yeah, he's been on the podcast. We actually really had a wonderful episode. Oh, with him. I I just yeah. think they're dismissing their own community. So, like, I just feel like, oh, these maggots, these like they're not truly like they don't <laughs> understand. Like, these why yeah. are you talking to these low lives, right? <laughs> like, like uh, no, but, way but to I, shit I on your own community. Is... I mean, when they do, when you're doing that, I mean, I'm I'm not okay. So this is not what about. Uh, what about is them? This is pointing hypocrisy because the whole the whole that war thing goes like okay. So if you want to do that war, then why are you mm-hmm. reaching out to atheists that lower Christian? Why are you not going after Doc? Or you only should do that war to uh, like atheist scholar. I don't know what the fuck you're being. <laughs> <Like, laughs> atheist scholar. Atheist scholar. Is it like, a Doc uh, and atheist and like or Sam, Yeah, like you have to go after <laughs> Sam Harris. Not you can't. Why are you talking to me? Right? I don't know. But I, 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 I think that there's a, so Abdullah, you were at my talk at, at the at UTM mm-hmm. yep, yep, right, yep, the other night. Yep. So, so what happened was, was that, and I know, so we've talked, Armin and I have talked about this here a lot, that the next step is really starting to engage with Muslims. And this is why we have you on, uh, because we know that you do that a lot right. and you're very, very good at it. So what happened in that audience is there were a lot of Muslim people in that audience. So Armin, I, I haven't told you all this yet because it was so recent, but uh, what they did was that they had some security concerns. So oh. a lot of the Muslim groups, because Mississauga is like where I live, there's a lot of Muslim people here. Um, they, they, um, the students went up to them a day before and they had raised a lot of concerns. So one of the security measures that they took, and this I've never really seen before, the university, first of all, stuck to it, which kudos to them in this yeah, atmosphere. Which university? They said, uh, this is the University of Toronto at Mississauga. Yeah. They said that, yeah, so this was an invite. It wasn't from a student group. It was actually from the university. It's called the Schneider Lecture. So so they had, uh, what they said was, uh, they told them that, you know, we believe in free speech, so we're going to have this sort of in, important dialogue. But as a way for the secure, to address the security concerns, they invited a professor of Islamic studies to come and do the first, and start off the Q&A with me afterwards. So that was actually a security measure. 
and he did come. Yeah. And we did have an exchange after that, which I, th- I think was really good. Um, and uh, there were many other sort of uh, people who were Islamic studies students and everything. In fact, I, I think at, at close to half of the people there were Muslims, right? And uh, so it was really, I, I think that's a really good way to engage people. That if if you have a talk, if you're doing a talk, I mean, Armin, you do talks and I do talks and stuff. And Abdullah, Abdullah I think you should start doing them if you haven't started already. Um, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, we, no, we should do, we should definitely. Yeah. We should have you on a panel, absolutely. Yeah. Um, but anyway, we'll we'll figure we'll talk about that later. But what we should do is that bring in Islamic studies professors as a way to after that. Can you give a response after the talk? Uh, we'll have the response from yeah. Professor blah I, blah blah. Honestly, like I'd rather have like a Muslim scholar, not an academic, because as you saw from the questions he was asking, like academics come from a very different perspective. Like the wall, like the the wall, like they're not even. I hate to say it, they're not proper Muslims. They're not like many people would even consider the things a guy was saying to be blasphemous. Like the Muslim professor, the questions he was asking you, and he was saying Rumi, wine drinking Muslims, ham eating Muslims, and he was saying like, and you know, like a kind of bigger, kind of more broad perspective, more inclusive kind of interpretation of Islam. Like these aren't what the common Muslims believe, right? Like so, I feel like Omar Khayyam. Yeah, like getting getting like a scholar, meaning like like like. Ali's frozen. You know, I don't know if they'll do it. Yeah, he was frozen for a second. Are you still? Yeah, he's dead. Okay. So yeah, like more than an academic, because academics they might even agree with us. Yeah, the hadith are not true. I I believe that most of them are fabricated. I believe that. Like you know, Reza Aslan in his book he says most of the hadith were just made up, right? In order to for the princes and the kings to kind of prove yeah, the, the whatever the, whatever they wanted, right? So I, I think we'd actually have more people agree with us from the from the academics perspective, but but I think we'd have a more interesting discussion with like hardline, like whether the Salafis or Wahhabis or Sufis or whatever, whichever is representative from the Muslim community. Like you, and it could be a professor. No, no, but, but we could do that too. We could bring yeah. them on. If we're doing, like this was in a university setting, so we got a university professor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, if we have another event that's outside, we could call an Islamic scholar. It's like, oh, so listen, we have an, a, an atheist. Sorry, you guys there? Yeah, we're still there. Yeah, we're still did here. I get frozen? Yeah. You were frozen for a second, but continue. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. Keep, keep talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, okay, sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, uh, is, uh, so, you know, we can have, we can say, okay, there's an atheist ex-Muslim doing a talk here, you know, he's the author of blah, blah, blah book, or he's the host of blah, blah, blah podcast, and uh, we would like you to come and give him a response. And I think a lot of Islamic scholars might jump at the opportunity when it's presented in that context. Mm. So, I, I, I just thought that it worked really well at this event, and yeah. the fact that he was coming over to give that response brought a lot of Muslim students there, and, and oh, yeah? it, it was a really it was a it was, it was a pretty packed crowd, and uh, and they came in. We had a very engaging Q and A session afterwards as well. So, and it went on for longer than it was supposed to. Mm-hmm. So, I, I think that um, that could just in terms of how to engage with Muslims. Um, this was an accidental discovery. Obviously, they did it for security reasons, but I think this is something that that we should try to do in in the events that we like, do what's too. It, what, can you spell them. it out? Like just having some uh, high profile Muslim scholars, representative of the community, scholar, uh, representative of the community. Like supposing Armin, supposing you come to Toronto over here. And and we do a talk. Supposing I'm doing a talk, right? Like the, the I did the other night, mm-hmm. and there's a the title and it's been promoted and people coming in. And then we say that and for, we talk to an Islamic scholar. We're like, this is a talk that's happening. We'd like you to come and after the talk, we want you to conduct the Q and A, mm-hmm. right, with the speaker, and to give a bit of a response before you start the Q and A. Uh, and you know the, whether it's a mom at the local mosque or whoever it is, Islamic scholar. And then when they come in and they say, okay, I'm going to be going over there and I'll be talking to this guy. That'll bring more Muslims into the audience as well, mm. and it'll actually result in some yeah. sort of engagement. So, um, in, in this case, it happened with a professor, and it worked that way. And I, I thought it worked. It was actually one of the most uh, enjoyable things I've done. So, uh, I, I think that, I, I, that that's an approach we should explore. By the way, yeah, guys, we need to do. We need to yeah. address patron questions at some point. Okay, let's yeah, let's do that. Abdullah, do you have anything else to say? We just go to patrons' questions. Uh no, no. Let's let's do the questions. Yeah. All right. Should I read them out? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, hold on. Uh, let's start from the beginning. So, yeah, Abdullah. Uh, okay, so Stephen 
Uh, Stephen is asking your recent video asking Muslims if oh, we no, can that criticize. Was funny. I already answered that. Oh, you already answered so, that. Okay. okay um, yeah. This, okay. This, this, Carol. Is about, this, this is about the Sid Sydney video I did in Australia. But go on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Carol is asking. Uh, this is a question to everybody. I teach at a school where a colleague wears a hijab. How do I discuss in my classes the topic of Muslim women taking off their hijabs without making it seem like a personal attack on her? Um, the the topic of Muslim women taking off the hijab. Uh, the, the, oh, okay, so who who wants to take this? Well, Should I speak? Oh, you mean like women in Iran that they are taking their hijab off? Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, go ahead. I'm. I have to think about this. Yeah. So so uh, the the way and I've actually talked about this uh, to audiences where there were a lot of hijabis, and uh, I have talked about how. Uh, there are a lot of women who have ideological problems with the hijab. There's a lot of people who wear the hijab for identity purposes. There are some people who are confused, like they're wearing the hijab, but they have ideological issues with it. They rebel against their parents. Why are you making me wear this? But when they go outside, they're concerned about being part of the Muslim community, you know, because of the rise of Trump or whatever. So they'll say that, uh, you know, um, that's why that's why I wear the hijab. There's many complicated reasons for it. So I'd sort of set up that context and really Let's frame it as a thing. Because we're getting going over time. So Ali, okay, so, in your answers. Okay, so I, I'd frame it as a thing of choice, right? If, if a woman wants to wear the hijab, she can. If she doesn't want to, she doesn't have to. But nobody should be forced to wear it. And unfortunately, the majority of women in the world who wear the hijab are forced to wear it in countries like Saudi Arabia and Iran and so on. I just want to say that I, way. I, okay, I, let's I, move on really I quickly. Wanna quickly wanna um, no, wait, 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 wait. Hey, I Ali, work in a library. Hey, Ali, <laughs> stop. <laughs> All right. Let me just quickly answer. I fir first, I think you have to see if um, Go ahead. I think there's a delay, <laughs> Ali. Yeah, I think Ali's there's, delayed yeah, Ali, there's a delay in the audio. Uh, Carol, uh, first, you have to see. Oh, if I'm not saying anything. <laughs> this is like, oh my god, yeah. this is so <laughs> Ali, you're a little bit delayed. Delayed, yeah, like delayed. Five, six seconds. Maybe go. But, yeah, maybe maybe ends maybe end the Skype and then come back in. Okay, but okay. Yeah. yeah. So I'll come back. Yeah, come back. Uh, all right. So can I talk now? All right. Yeah. So um, I, I, I suggest first figuring out if they want to talk about it, right? Before you talk to them, right? Just uh, just see if, uh, I mean, maybe it's not well. Fair, the first step is to see who wants to have a conversation. Um, I mean, the worst thing you could do is make somebody feel uncomfortable. I mean, we, we do want to reach out to people, but we want to reach out to people that are okay with us. I mean, I don't want to force any content on people, right? Like when we when we put our content on our website and our YouTube and our Facebook page and our uh, then people come and find us, it's them coming to us. But if it's in a workplace area uh, and then you're going into somebody and talking to them about something, I think maybe now they're not in a position to not hear your your opinions, right? So first establish first make it known maybe ask is that hey i have some questions are you comfortable with me talking to you about it and if not then just don't talk about it what do you think is that fair i don't think right all right good this next huh? question where's ali <laughs> i'm here oh yeah I'm you're gonna hear me you're very small i have to make you bigger hey <laughs> what the that's personal <laughs> all right yeah, no, 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 uh, no, all right next question. um uh, Harris is saying, Harris Sultan, who's also one of my uh, favorite guys nowadays. Uh, Abdullah Samir, what are your views on our friend Flying Donkey? <laughs> is that something I don't know. What was the question we had, it's, it's an inside joke. He's, uh, <laughs> we had a, we had a um, friendly, friendly disagreement about, it, it goes back to a lot of the things we were discussing about, you know, like, you know, certain topics, which I think, uh, you know, which we disagreed on whether it's a good topic to bring up, like the pedophile thing. Um, for example, Burak, you know, one of the common things non-Muslims will say is, you guys believe in a flying donkey. Ha, ha, ha. Like that, right? <laughs> so we had a disagreement, me and Hal Sultan, about, about this topic. But I think we actually agree more than we disagree. And there is a there is a point where you can make that point and you can say Muslims believe in a flying donkey. But I, I do feel a lot of times... The point is is kind of lost because as a you know my from my perspective, it's no different than saying you know like it's funny to me especially when a Christian says you guys believe in a flying donkey, because 
you guys believe in the Lord of the universe, you know, killing himself on the cross, you know, or something like you can, you know, you can come up with so many absurdities. Right, right. Uh, all of it. Yeah, yeah, it's all, yeah, all of it is like snakes, that, right? rib, worms, yeah, exactly. birth, rib, yeah. living inside a fish. Yeah, like, like there's so yeah. many things. And so like the flying donkey thing, it's kind of like, ha ha, like it's so easy to pick on. Right. But it's, it's like technically God could do that if he wanted to. So I don't see it as a good point because it's, it's like, it's one of the, it's one of the consequences of believing in the religion. It's not like a point of faith per se. Mm. So I just feel like, yeah, you know, it's not the best point to use, but you can, it has its uses. Let's put it like that. Moose okay. is saying, um, when Muslims leave Islam, do any of them still hold on to any of their Muslim culture and old beliefs? When I decided mm. n uh, to not care about being Catholic anymore, I never paid pay any attention to religion. After I became an atheist, I now say religion is poison and very cultist. Uh, I mean, it, get, it depends on people. I know, I know, a I know some Muslims that are not Muslim anymore. They're ex-Muslim. And they still want to do, I mean, very I mean, less, I would say less Muslims want to have, keep anything cultural about Islam. Uh, I notice a lot of uh, Jewish people that don't believe still more than anybody else keeps part of the culture. Uh, Christians mostly keep like Christmas uh, and some other stuff. Some of them still go to church, even if they, even though they don't believe. But I think Muslim less than, mo mo Muslims have been more hurt by Islam. I think, and I think uh, the bad experience Muslims have with Islam makes less Muslims want to keep anything, uh, any of their experience. But there are still some Muslims that want to keep part of the culture. But I think I've seen it less than other people that leave religion. And it's, I, I mean, I even we even know Muslims that uh, ex-Muslims that can't even stand anything Islamic, right? Uh, like. I mean, I remember Yasmin when she was hearing Quranic verses, she would actually cover her ears because she couldn't actually hear it. Right? Uh, I had this. I had a very when I became an ex-Muslim, uh, I didn't want to have anything like anything Islamic at all. Would just gross me out. Like it was disgusting uh, experience. But then after a couple of years, I now go back and now I enjoy it as history and you know. But mm -hmm. but but yeah, I think it really depends, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I want to add. I want to add something really quick to that, and I'm going to reference again Phil Zuckerman, who wrote a book called "Faith No More: Why People Reject Religion," and he talked about. And I've mentioned this here before. He talked about mild apostasy versus transformative apostasy. Mild apostasy is some, something like me. I had generally an accepting family, so I still take part in Eid. I still take part in parts of Ramadan. I still, my, you know, my my wife and I still go to Jamaat Khan sometimes because you know she came from that tradition, has a similar family background. But we are privileged. There are many other people, like Armin said, Yasmin, for instance, who came from a background of transformative apostasy, where they were oppressed by the religion. They were forced to starve during Ramadan and fast. They were forced to pray. They were beaten and so on. And, and they, they're triggered by those memories, and they don't want to have anything to do with it. So there's a lot of diversity among ex-Muslim experience. Last question by Hello? Kirill Ab uh, Abdullah. Wait, Abdullah, do you have anything to say to that? Or? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's different for everybody. And I do feel like if you're living in a no majority non-Muslim country, you're much less likely to do, you know, be doing the cultural things of Islam per se. Um, I just saw a comment by his. Yeah, so like I, I'd say like honestly, it, it varies from person to person. There's no harm in it like if you feel okay with it. I do think that when people leave Islam, sometimes they feel so traumatized by it that they want they want nothing to do with it. And that's, I feel like, you know, it's kind of probably a natural thing that happens. And eventually as time goes by, you kind of calm down a bit and you're like, okay, it's fine. At the end of the world, if someone says, yeah, or whatever, like, you know, it's, yeah, it's yeah. not the end of the world, whatever. Okay. Like, you know what I mean? Of, yeah. Harry Sultan is saying Abdullah Samir still <laughs> has some Muslim in him. He said he still washes his ass. Actually, I think that's the only good thing about Islam. I still, I still can't, I, to this day, I still can't believe that people don't, yeah, just only wipe. Uh, but I, I agree. Yeah, the, yeah, the water. It's important. You got to get some water in there, especially if you're a little yeah. hirsute. Basically, uh, so yeah. every every uh, yeah. Actually, that's the only good thing that we I, uh, we kept from Islam. I think. Uh, Kirill is asking Abdullah, did any of your family cut uh, ties with you when you left Islam? And if yes, how did you deal with it? 
So I have uh, I have a longer kind of explanation on my blog. Um, if you want to check it out, because we're kind of running late now and I am mm-hmm. falling asleep. But yeah, it's on abdullahsimila.com if anyone wants to check it out. But in a nutshell, uh, just quickly, I, I'm lucky. Most of my family is very really liberal and nobody cut ties with me. So I'm, I'm really lucky, very really blessed. I was able to come out openly as an atheist and I just told them and they were like, okay, for the most part. Like my brother is very religious and so he wasn't very happy about my decision and he had a hard time with it. Is he still and religious? Yes, very much so. Uh, but other than him, the you rest made of the him time, religious, and now he's religious. Yeah, unfortunately, I was involved in that. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's kind of interesting. I think you know we were talking about before how like all of this stuff is it's it's all bullshit and it's all bad and stuff. But you know when it comes to when you have when it comes to family acceptance, I think if more ex-Muslims had families that were even if they were religious, they were the kind of religious where they accepted them. Yeah. then I think that's a good start because that at least lets us in the room. So anyway, that that's something I just thought of but anyway listen we're gonna before abdullah where, falls asleep where he's can, been very, I, I yeah, go ahead. he's falling asleep Armin? where can people find you yeah exactly so um i'm i'm obviously on twitter and facebook and all that but the main way to to check out my stuff is on on my blog abdullahsamina.com so i have all my articles there and i've sorted them and in, in, by by order of importance so all the top posts the most important arguments i think against islam are, uh, right on the front page so everything's there if anyone wants to check it out thanks mike is right. saying thank you for a very interesting episode abdullah you are a great communicator i'll check out your thank stuff you. i'll check out your stuff for sure yeah, we got to get you on the speaking circuit, man. Yes, I mean, this yeah, is like you, yeah. You're very, very engaging, and so you're incredibly Thank fun you. to listen. Yeah, maybe that's the next, uh, yeah, next step for me. Oh. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll do some stuff. Hopefully. I want to try and get some stuff uh, sorted together. By the way, thank you to our patrons in the live chat. You guys are amazing. Thank you for uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, Harry Sultan, Mike, Carol. Oh, Ali is in the live chat. Um, yeah, <laughs> Steph. Stephen, is that Stephen or Steve, Stephen, Stephen, Stephen? Stephen, it's the Stephen. same. You still say Stephen. All right, Stephen. It's like prosecute and persecute. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm just bugging you. Okay, around. okay. It's okay. All right, all right. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you, guys. And I'm going to s- stop streaming. This is my awkward ending. Okay. Bye. The Secular Jihadists have been made possible thanks to the Illuminati and the covert support of Israel and the CIA. That's what we have been told, but we haven't received our checks yet. If you like what we do, please support us. Share the podcast with your friends. Write and tweet us with topic and guest suggestions. Or head over to secularjihadist.com and give a dollar or more for exclusive access to live video. Have your questions read and answered on the air and more. Till next time, may the flying spaghetti monster be with you.